Hello, everyone, and welcome to Fiddler's Green podcast number 42, The Shadow of the Fallen God. As you might have guessed, this one's going to be off to a little bit of a bumpy start. It's been one hell of a week on my end. I usually want to do about three of these podcasts per month. Last week, I was on my friend Last Things channel to record a podcast on Titus Andronicus. And at the time, I thought it would be more or less a live presentation. And so the idea was is that I just swap out that live stream for this one. But apparently what Last Things plan is is going to be essentially to record a bunch of these videos and then present them as part of a holiday film festival. So that left me kind of off my usual schedule. In addition to this, I've just been completely swamped at work. So I've been sitting with that and a bunch of essay ideas, kind of wondering how I'm going to get this podcast back on track and what, what am I going to actually talk about? And, and through all of this, of course, we've had a very, very busy, busy week. We're coming up on the Halloween season, and I just kind of wanted to give an overview, maybe just a rambling reaction to the things that are going on in the news today. I I imagine this podcast is going to be a lot less structured than the, than the one previously, because I think it. I don't. I don't really have a plan for this one, and I don't think I really should. I think I should just have an organic reaction to the situation. But I'll start off with a little bit of of light speculation, a little bit of light celebration for the holiday season. I, I have been kind of getting into the mood of Halloween, getting into the mood of, of fall time. I was writing an essay on this, and I hope maybe I'll get it out soon. Essay should be the main focus of, of this channel. And so I kind of want people, I want, I want people to direct people to the Substack or direct people to the video essay as always. But I know these are, these are popular. But when we're, we're not working, and my wife and I are both really, really busy these days, the, we're, we're watching more horror movies. Or I should say, is my wife's usually watching a horror movie and I'm trying to work on an essay in the background. Or maybe I'll watch it with her or something like that. But it, it does give you a sense of of some cultural changes. And this is one thing I've, I've kind of realized is that I, I mentioned this on other podcasts before. I mentioned this on other live streams. But the horror movie is the one element of, of culture that's really managed to survive the great decline as we've experienced it in the last half decade. All movies these days are terrible. All movies that we encounter all pieces of cultural fiction don't seem to really capture anything that's real. Uh, they're, they're almost kind of, I guess we had Barbie. Barbie kind of captures something that was real by being an active element in the culture war itself. So in the classic postmodern sense, and I didn't even watch Barbie, but in the classic postmodern sense, you could watch Barbie and also be part of the experience of watching Barbie. And Barbie was a commentary on itself. And so half of the people watching Barbie were commenting on their own social media reaction to Barbie. It was a very, very postmodern, postmodern experience. The difficulty with most modern culture is that nobody really wants to describe the reality they're experiencing. There's no market for describing the reality as we're experiencing it. And there's a, there's a large market for sort of self-delusion and putting things off and not coming to terms with 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 what's actually going on around us it, except for the horror movie the horror movie seems to be the one movie that still speaks in the language of reality for modern people I might go to presentation mode here oops i almost forget how to do this it's been such a long time <laughs> and you know how long has my wife been watching these horror movies we've been at it for about a month or so and I mean, she she starts early on these things, and, and I have noticed that there's a there's a few distinct eras of horror movies, and people have commented on this for for a while, right? So there's the initial classic age of horror, and this this is really what everyone remembers the old Universal movies, so the 1933 Draculas, the, the Frankenstein's, the and these movies you know, you, you rewatch them, and, and they're good. I, I would say that there's there's sort of a division in all of these things. So everyone knows Frankenstein, Wolfman, um, Dracula, the original one with Bela Lugosi. These are all classics. These movies that Universal released were, in some sense, a reaction to sort of horror movies that came out actually not. 
to remove from these movies. Uh, these were what we call the pre-code horror movies. So the pre-core horror, the pre-code horror movies would be things like The Phantom of the Opera, or they'd be things like Freaks, another classic horror movie that come that, that you know that's the classic meme where all it's basically about the circus trapeze artist who marries the dwarf in the freak show because he's getting enormously wealthy from some kind of inheritance. And then she conspires to kill him. And there's this, they, they, they actually cast real freaks in the, I don't like to say freak. They cast people who work in freak shows as part uh, of this uh, movie. And a lot of the images are just these sort of body horror images of these people who have horrible deformities, who were real circus performers who worked in freak shows and this this comes up with the famous scene that you've seen again and again from the internet memes where the freaks induct this woman into their society of freaks and they pass around this giant goblet of wine and they yell, one of us, one of us, goobble gobble, and they all clap. And there's just this complete feeling of surreality. Also in the pre-code category, you'd have things like uh, the cab- cabinet of Dr. Caligari, I might even include things like Fritz Lang's Metropolis and Nos- Nosferatu, although those are silent era and sometimes conceived of as, as separately. But, but this classic era of horror, uh, it seemed to understand something. And, you know, the, the universal pictures that everyone remembers, the Frankensteins, the Draculas, uh, the code I don't think had been written yet. The code being the Hayes Code. And the Hayes Code had all these regulations about the depiction of gore, about the depiction of, of bodily mutilation, about how good always had to triumph over evil, and so on and so forth. So there couldn't be any unhappy or ambiguous endings. There always had to be a happy ending because the idea was is that this media was... It was uh, they rightly understood that all media of this type would be seen as aspirational in a way that a novel really wouldn't. And so when you when you depicted a horrific ending that 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 showed evil triumphing over good, like you know a lot of classic horror movies did, you'd uh, naturally sort of encourage this perception in people that I'm going to see if this works better. Uh, you'd be naturally encourage this perception among people that that maybe it pays to be evil, and maybe evil is a stronger force, and there's a spiritual allure, a romanticism to evil itself. And it's not it's not completely irrational to think this and we should be thinking this way more and more these days, because even even if you go back to the the original sort of romantic period where people wrote these these torrid romances about not necessarily even uh, monsters, not even necessarily vampires, but just about people uh, having like Wuthering Heights or or (laughs) or Wilkie Collins or any of these things, people would read these stories about tragic endings and they would actually repeat them in their own lives there were several women who threw themselves to their deaths uh for sort of failed love affairs because they read about it in in uh, uh, romantically in, in novels these are things that actually went on i mean life imitates art because art naturally has this religious religious dimension to it and so what you see in many of these ne- these old 1930s movies is they, they've got like a really good concept. I mean, first of all, they're all cliched, right? We all know Boris Karlov as Frankenstein. We all know Bela Lugosi as, as Dracula. Uh, these things have been so regurgitated and recycled that they, uh, they're kind of like cliché. Uh, you, you're, you know all the lines, blah, 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 blah. And then all, all the mystery is kind of taken out of the equation because of that. But what you see in a lot of these movies that are that are coming right after the code or are anticipating the code is that they have this great premise. They have a great sense uh, of romance and spookiness that inhabits them in, in most elements of their uh, of of most elements of their existence of, of their of their stage presence in the early acts, and then they just kind of end. They just they always end sort of with uh, an overly neat climax where the creature gets destroyed in a very very convenient way and it feels incredibly attacked on uh, all, all of these movies felt like the, i mean some of them were cut for budget but they they, they all kind of have this uh, the end kind of expression to it that a lot of the older movies in the pre-code era didn't have they, they were more in connection to the old understanding of the ghost story of the, the old understanding of the horror story where the incompleteness and the uncertainty was was was, was largely part of it 
and I'm I'm kind of getting on this is obviously you know it, it's kind of funny to think about it that that the, the great sort of horror masters that mold our own understanding of horror like H.P. Lovecraft and I guess you know there's there are a number of horror writers in the 1920s I think M.R. James was a little bit earlier obviously the turn of the screw and and the James uh, James's turn in the screw was even older than that. And in the, I think of it as the 1890s, right? But the, there were a lot of great ghost stories coming up around this time period. But the movies kind of seemed mired in, in a medium that didn't really understand or realize itself. Uh, then, you know, you get this period of very lackluster horror movies, the 1950s, the, the Vincent Price era horror movies. I think there's a lot of stuff that's good. Uh, there's lots of that's interesting that goes on, but it's always individual scenes. The movies themselves don't really have any direction to them. They seem to be playing it halfway in between a classic 1930s style universal picture where there's a creature feature, a killing that happens off screen, and then a resolution where the monster gets destroyed very neatly in the end. And, you know, you have people playing with things like ambiguous endings, like in The Mask of the Red Death. And this is this is obviously anticipating the end of the Hayes Code. And then you get to the actual end of the Hayes Code, you have a new renaissance of horror movies that occurs in things like Rosemary's Baby, that occurs in things like The Exorcist, that is that, that's present in a lot of the early The Living Dead movies. And, and these are what I would call sort of sub, the subversive horror era of the of the franchise. <laughs> I can see my wife in the chat already, but it is what it is. Um and it, it, it's kind of funny how, how these things work in, in phases, right? The, the, the subversive horror movies of the, of the late 60s and early 70s had a ha sort of haunted quality to them because they described sort of an implicit poison in the background. You know, I'm, I'm thinking of great examples of this. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll just call them out right now. For instance... Uh, I, we, my wife didn't watch this one recently, but Rosemary's Baby is nat naturally a great movie. I mean, it's a flawed creation. It's thoroughly a product of its own time. I want to say that Sharon Tate played in it, but I don't think she actually did. I think she was supposed to be part of this movie, but she wasn't actually the main character, which adds a different dimension to that because she was famously the, the victim of a horrible, almost satanic cult in Charles Manson. But... The, the subversiveness is that, is that the movie is actually dialoguing with something real. And the movie Rosemary's Baby is dialoguing with the fact that Christianity is manifestly disappearing inside of society at the very moment when emerging from the roots of society is an evil that can't really be comprehended or only can be comprehended in the language of, of the old world. This is something that I think, you know, you see in the 1930s, uh, the movies of the 1930s, or at least the universal ones, is that the, the monster always has a foreign origin or usually has a foreign origin. Things are being resurrected from the past always. I don't know if I call, man, Dracula, obviously, Frankenstein, notoriously. Uh, Frankenstein is interesting because I think the idea of Mary Shelley was that Frankenstein was a quintessential sort of British style thinker. But the way that Frankenstein is, is usually set in this very, very Teutonic German setting, usually it's Switzerland or southern Germany or, or the Alps, uh, the fact that Frankenstein himself seems like a very, very foreign character, if not sort of Faustian in his own right, quite, I would say like almost quite literally Faustian in his own right, he, he distinctly does not feel like, it doesn't feel like you could meet a Frankenstein. It doesn't mean like, it doesn't feel like you could be no one could just have like, oh, I was going along my day and I just happened to be Frankenstein. Frankenstein is a very particular character and he brings in from the outside via science a very particular horror in the same way that Dracula is a very particular monster who comes from Eastern Europe only brought about by something in the distant past. So whether it's being brought in from the distant past of the Middle Ages, the way that Dracula is, or whether it's being brought in from the far future, in Mary Shelley's case, <laughs> the far future being reanimation in the form of, of regalvanization in, Dra in, in, in Frankenstein, these, these are always external threats. And even in the pre-code stuff like Freaks, for the Freaks themselves are distinctly outside uh, and and in order to kind of end up in the, their world, the person has to commit a crime, like a horrible crime of, of marrying someone for money and then murdering them. And then 
then all of a sudden bubbling up from this outside society, these people who literally exist on the margins of society, literally exist as, free, as freaks, those come bubbling up as actual horror creatures around her, and she realizes that there's a deeper reality. But, but still, very much in these old movies, it's always external. And you know, I've always remembered the, the cabinet of Dr. Caligari, I don't know if this is in the original one, but in, in in the twist ending, there's a bad ending for the cabinet of Dr. Caligari. And the, the, the director, anticipating that there would be Hayes Code type regulations for this movie, even though the Hayes Code was years away from being made, he tacked on this ending, this, this little denouement that suggested that maybe it could be actually a happy ending. So it could be legalized in certain countries that were more puritanical about their outlooks. I, I, I like that touch to it. But in, in, in the 70s with the subversive horror movies or the late 60s, now all of a sudden you have uh, the it could be you type horror movies. The it could be you. You could just wander into a situation and find yourself in a horror movie without actually doing anything to anything outside the ordinary to, to actually involve yourself in this horror. Uh, the, the quintessential one is Rosemary's Baby. I... I We'll name a better one, that's just Exorcist. I think Rosemary's Baby, again, is a very flawed creation. But it's about sort of the the boomer equivalent of the, the rootless cosmopolitan urbanites who are living their lives in the, the free love 60s. Uh, they're married, but they're still living uh, what seems to be a very, very kind of hedonistic lifestyle for a married couple. And and they just step into, uh, oh, I guess I should say the woman at least, steps into a horrific reality where she seems to be bringing to term this demonic creature inside of her, which is, of course, the concept. And all the while, I mean, it just, it's just a movie that could not exist any time outside of, of the late 60s and early 70s. Because the, the real horror is, is that the woman herself can't believe anything like this could be happening. So she's puncturing through the understanding of modernity itself, or I should say like early modernity itself coming to terms with, with the reality of it. It's sort of a slow cook horror movie. A much better instance of this is The Exorcist, which I, I just watched. And you know, I, I watched this movie, and I, again, I think it's a flawed creation, but it's just absolutely brilliant how they do this. Uh, and they actually kind of incorporate both elements. Uh, they, there literally is the, 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 the sort of pre Hayes Code movie going on. And then there's the Rosemary Baby movie in the end. And the, the two halves of the movie dovetail in the exorcism. So on one hand, you have a story of a priest that's being haunted by an external demon uh, or demon called, oh my, the, the demon is literally this Babylonian or Assyrian god called Pazazu, which is this god of plague and wind. It's literally a, a deity that was worshipped in, in Mesopotamia. And this, this old priest is kind of struggling with this external threat. And at the same time, you have this woman uh, who's, again, living a very modern life. She's, she's literally a film actress. And she's, she's engaged. She, I mean, it's kind of funny because I feel like all of these movies have implicitly the Manson murders going on in the background. And I'm sure that they have some, someone who's really studied in the lore of Hollywood will tell you exactly how these connect to the Manson murders in Hollywood that were going on around this time. But she's involved with, with a Hollywood film crew shooting a documentary. I think this is in Washington, D.C., but shooting a documentary on student protests. Uh, is it a documentary or is it an actual film? So you have like this, you have this backdrop of an incredibly skeptical, godless society that's literally talking about tearing down the scriptures, the strictures of the old. And then it kind of has this collision inexplicably. And the same thing is true for Rosemary's Baby. There is no explanation, really. Uh, I mean, I guess there is a little bit. There's like a, a, a scene that has a Ouija board attached to it, which for people who are of a Catholic persuasion is recognize as one of the many ways that you you do not want to be trying to commune with malevolent spirits this is one trying to commune with malevolent spirits is one way that the demons can come into someone's life but other than that this woman's life just gets broadsided by this incredibly powerful demonic force and the, the 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 drama has to be reconciling. I mean, and there's this there's this middle case of this priest who's dealing with a, a, an elderly mother who is dying of of dementia, and uh, the big struggle 
uh, of this this priest, this this sort of middle story, is that he can't come to terms with the fact that this woman needed to be in a thick community of other people like her who are believers. And this priest, he's done all the right things. He's become, he's, he's joined the priesthood. He's kept the faith. He's in whatever, or, you know, other than having a family, that's what every good Italian son should be doing, right? Is, is going down one of these two routes. He's done everything right. And at the end of, 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 of this life, his, his mother is dying inside of this apartment complex that is this complete rat trap. And she has no community to support her. The city is dying in a crime wave. It's completely unsafe to go outside. And and all this guy can do, all this all this pillar of the community can do, is kind of uh, impotently lobby his parish to do something more for his mother. And all the while they say, oh, you're one of the best. We need you. We need you on the front lines, Father, to be both a psychologist and a priest in these in these hard times. And yet... No one can save his mother. No one can do the very thing for his own family that, that he's being asked to do for others. And so uh, this is a verse of four. And, and of course, he is the bridge between the old world monster and the new ones. I, I'm kind of rambling here as, as a warm up. But um, the uh, the interesting thing about this is I, I like how these early subversive films just sort of capture. I and mean, I think they only... You could only really have these subversive films in the late, in in the early seventies, and they kind of segue to, to a brief period of of relatively bad horror movies in the eighties and nineties. My wife watched Dracula and Fra Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with Robert De Niro. Uh, both of these movies are just terrible. Um, they're totally unsuited for what the story actually is. And they try to superimpose an entertainment product on the story itself. They, they try to be, okay, we're, they're more interested in modernizing these stories and they're figuring out what, than they are in figuring out what's actually horrifying about these stories to begin with. They're not trying to commune with it. A little more interesting was the, was the, the, the M. Night Shyamalan movies that, I mean, there's two of them that we watched, The Village and The Sixth Sense. And The, the Sixth Sense, I mean, it's, it's still a really good movie. It's kind of amazing. Like, M. Night Shyamalan, people make fun of him for being a bad filmmaker. And it's not like, it's not a very subtle movie. But it does it does capture the fundamental understanding of, 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 of sort of being a parent. And this is another problem in, in, uh, in The Exorcist as well. That... And The Exorcist, they're broad... Uh, in The Exorcist... The child, again, a child of a single parent, is completely snatched up by a horrifically malevolent entity that this comes out of nowhere. In The Sixth Sense, the, the child is being eaten away by a whole ocean of history that he's not being prepared to inhabit. He's not, being, he's not prepared to inhabit this world that is deep, that has deep spiritual realities going on in it, and which everyone else can ignore, but he can't. I think that's sort of the core of the sixth sense, is that, and this, the mother is completely unable to 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 grasp the spiritual realities of the world too. So I think you know it's funny how the other one, all of the good. I mean, the, what are the good M Night Shyamalan movies? The good M Night Shyamalan movies are Signs. Un 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 Unbreakable was another one that was really good of his. The Sixth Sense and The Village. And are these good movies? No, they're not good movies. They're kind of bad movies because other than The Sixth Sense, they all have really, really big mistakes in them. R enormous plot holes that is impossible to ignore. Uh, enormous character flaws and characters doing strange things. Absolutely weirdly delivered dialogue lines that just take you out of the movie instantaneously. But I will defend those four movies or so as they are because... M. Night Shyamalan, for that brief period, you know, in the late 90s and early 2000s, understood sort of the moment of horror that he was addressing. The moment of horror he was addressing was, was this reality where people couldn't come to terms. And this is true of all, all four of the movies. All four of the movies have the ba same basic plot. There, there's something deeply spiritual and supernatural going on behind the scenes. Or in The Village, there's something deeply supernatural not going on behind the scenes, but it's kind of an inversion of the trope. 
and the characters slowly have to come to the realization that they need to deal with this directly. And the the chief issue, I guess, I mean, the characters are much more wooden and there's not really a sense of horror that's not contrived by jump scares, which is a big problem. But it does speak to, I think, the general feeling in the 2000s that, that something desperately from the past was missing. Uh, you, know, you can go through the ones. In, in, in the sixth sense, it's, the, it's the, the, the spiritual crisis is because the, in a city of great history, Philadelphia, and a sister, perhaps other than Boston, perhaps, one of the cities in America that has the deepest history, this kid is somehow tapped into the spiritual power of the histo- history uh, of the historical, uh, 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 should I say, uh, of, the, of the deep history that lies behind him, of all the spirits who have gone before him and what it requires, and everyone else is oblivious to it, and he's disconnected. In Unbreakable, the idea is is that uh, the the villain in the case is, is deeply aware that there is a need for heroism, and. <laughs> It's kind of a silly story, but he essentially he essentially forces people to or forces the protagonist to occupy the role of the hero, despite the fact that that's absent in the world. And the same thing for signs, the signs that there's a spiritual crisis. Uh, there's a spiritual crisis in in and the 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 one in the face of this spiritual crisis of literal aliens showing up. The one leader in the community, the priest, is unable to do his job and and has to come to terms with it. Uh, this is the strength of all of these movies that uh, that that makes them kind of watchable and enjoyable, despite the fact that they're kind of objectively bad movies. Is that I think that in the two thousands, people or millennials at least were looking for some kind of spiritual story to be part of in, in a world that really had none or had none to take seriously. And and I guess it it might be indicative of M Night Shyamalan's work that the only thing that they could come up with is like these deeply silly kind of uh, jump scare horror movies that that kind of the, that his movies devolve into after after the longest time. And uh, you know I, I I'm going to move on here to the the last genre of movies that the really good ones that have come up recently, and, and they emerge with things like the, the Ari Aster horror movies. Uh, the first one I remember seeing was The Witch. Uh, and these were what I call sort of tableau horror movies. And, and they prefigure something that's even darker that's happening in our own age, which is that now suddenly spiritual entities, are, it's kind of the inversion of the problem of M. Night Shyamalan. The problem of M. Night Shyamalan was, well, we feel like there should be an epic superhero movie going on in the background. We feel like there should be uh, these ghosts. And, and the characters feel this need to confront them. And then, okay, thank God they actually happen in the movie. But, of course, no one watching the actual movie believes in them. So it's kind of a funny time. It's kind of a silly thing. No one, no one believes in the horror going on. It's, it's almost kind of a convenient plot element. And I can say that's sort of a problem with M. Night Shyamalan movies is that none of the spiritual conflicts are very real. I mean, the guy's having a, a spiritual crisis of faith because he doesn't feel like he actually can confront evil. And then suddenly evil aliens show up and boom, like, you know, he just he just plugs into it. Right. Uh, the kid is feeling alienated because he can see the death that, that is in every single moment and every single day because we live on top of a mountain of skulls of our ancestors. And, and no one else can appreciate how deep reality is except him. But boom, it turns out that every single ghost he encounters has like a really easy mystery for him to solve. And then he solves it and the ghosts are at peace. And it all wraps up nice in a nice little package, right? And, you know, you could go through uh, Unbreakable too, right? Like this guy thinks that he wants people to be part of a su- superhero movie. And, and boom, he finds an actual real superhero. And the thing turns into a superhero movie. And, I mean, it, it's funny because the individual concept of the M. Night Shyamalan one movies is deeper than he actually the movie he actually creates is just kind of it's kind of silly and how neat it is and how how neat and nice and tidy it gets wrapped up but, but i think it's almost the utter inversion of, of the modern ari aster movies like hereditary or or midsummer and uh and uh the or, or i should say the witch right uh these movies are movies where and i think this is really the development that's unique to our own time where they say like, okay, reality doesn't make sense. You know it doesn't make sense. I know it doesn't make sense. I'm not saying like you're living like in the 
the the subversive horror movies of the 1970s. I'm not saying reality doesn't make sense in that, like you're living comfortable 1970s lifestyles being young urbanites. And then, you know, something that doesn't make sense comes in because you, you've neglected God and the spiritual. I'm not saying like the 1930s, like some foreign entity like Frankenstein or Dracula has come in either from the future or the past. That doesn't make sense. I'm saying you live in a world where like pretty regularly nothing makes sense or nothing works like it should be. So you're going through your world and you're just bewildered. You're bewildered for whatever reason. You're in an insane world. How, I mean, like, obviously, ghosts just can't walk into the frame of the picture and just stay there, right? Because that would ruin it, right? I mean, Dracula can't just walk into the room and go, I'm a vampire and I'm going, and, and you're doomed. Because that, would, that wouldn't be suspenseful. But that's exactly what these movies challenge you to do. Like, okay, we're now in an insane world. Now, how surprised would you be if inside a tableau, like you just saw a horrific figure that was obviously a demanding entity waiting to carry you away? How surprised would you be that Satan became a goat and murdered your entire family? How, how, how crazy would that be? There was another one that came out that was like lamb. I, I don't want to, I guess I will spoil this movie, right? But, you know, it's like about this, it's about this woman who raises a lamb as her own child and it slowly becomes human. And, and, it, and it opposed to, you know, as opposed to just saying, okay, well, we're, this is a psychological horror movie. It was a real lamb the entire time. And wouldn't it be crazy if it wasn't? Uh, they just walk into the entire surrealist aspect of it and, and challenge you to kind of say that it's silly. In the world we live in, how silly would it be if if this land literally just became human, like this this horrific beast man that, that that murdered its parents? How horrific would it be if a demonic entity literally inhabited your son? And you can see it in 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 full view of the frame. It's not in the corner. It's not it's not implicit or anything like that. And that's kind of the, the mode we're in right now. There, There's a, I think this entire talk is going to kind of revolve around more goth essays because they've been on my mind a lot recently. Every one of Morgoth's essays, or, I mean, he, he has a lot of good essays, but, <coughs> but once every three months, he has one that really sits in my mind as an analogy that I just take forward and use to unlock a lot of other keys here. And I, I wouldn't say this is one of his best essays, but he, he wrote this essay where it was, it, he said, to, this week, the United States announced that aliens exist. Like there was literally like government employees that announced that aliens existed just a few weeks ago. And nobody cared. Uh, n nobody cared because day to day, we see so many horrific things that don't make sense. They don't fit into any ordinary expectation of reality. Uh, we just kind of flip past them. We don't know what to do with that information. What does it mean that aliens are here? Like if aliens just landed tomorrow, like literally, let's say like you just, a UFO just passed over New York City and then disappeared again. Like how relevant would that be? What did it even mean? Uh, we have no idea because we have no ordinary expectation for how our, our lives should move as people in the West. There's an ordinary expectation in the 1930s about how people's lives were supposed to move, the stages of life. But but now everyone is convinced, you know, and Morgoth attributed this to saturation in media, but I don't think it has anything to do with saturation in the media. I don't think it's because we're oversaturated saturated in movie images of aliens. Again, I, I, we weren't even seeing a lot of movie images of aliens recently anyway, and we certainly don't see them very much on YouTube. The, the high point of the alien thing was really in the 1990s. Uh, the problem is, is that there's just no ordinary understanding of, of life. I mean, if our lives aren't going to be disrupted by aliens, will it be AI? Will it be another mega plague, you know, another designed virus like COVID escaping from a lab? Will it be a nuclear war with Russia? I mean, we're seeing this every day. And the thing is, is that those things actually have impact on our lives. So the absolute horrific, the absolutely bizarre, the absolutely paranormal can enter into our realities. And it, it, it goes unremarked. It goes on without reaction. And the, the, the real question is not what... The real question is not... Oh, how we horrifically react to this perversity. 
But what can we expect as, as normality? What can we expect as how things should operate? I think this is indicative of something. I mean, it's 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 kind of bizarre to see these movies appear in theaters. I'm really more creeped out by their existence uh, of this tableau horror than I am of 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 like the actual things they depict because I feel like it it shows sort of a spiritual acknowledgement that outright perversity can walk openly in our presences, and we like lambs can't really. We're, we're forced to kind of turn a blind eye to it because to stand up and look the perversity straight in its face and to acknowledge what it was would be to acknowledge the horrible faith that people taste is in the air. There's, there's a sense that is everywhere that something horrible is going to happen to the human race, to America, to the West, and we're all just waiting for it. And so what happens is that the monsters can literally walk around in plain sight. Like aliens could go over New York City. We wouldn't react to them because we wouldn't want to acknowledge that another horrific reality is there waiting for us. And another apocalypse is on the scene. Because the problem with the apocalypse on the screen is regardless of whether, uh, whether we acknowledge it there or not, we can't do anything about it. I mean, we're like sheep that are looking as the farmer stalks through the pen uh, blade in hand for the slaughter. Uh, what can you do except look away and hope that he doesn't pick you to be next? Uh, the, and, and I feel in this in this mode, uh, strange spiritual entities are, are kind of re-emerging in our midst. There's uh, This kind of gets me to the, the main part of, of my conversation or our talk tonight, which is the reaction to the next current thing. The, the thing that everyone's talking about. I mean, the thing that everyone's talking about, the, the next current thing, is the, the current war in Gaza or the Israel-Palestine conflict. To, or, I don't know how many iterations we're on this currently. Originally, I was really trying to figure out a way to talk about this. And I just thought to give sort of an organic reaction. We'll go through what actually happened and, and kind of come to terms with what's going on now. What actually seems to have happened was that Hamas was able to overwhelm through strength of numbers and through rocket barrage a small section of the Israeli security gate and when was then able to just pour over, maybe I should change the slides here, was able to just pour over a bunch of, uh, of Hamas fighters into the south portion of Israel. To what point they simply murdered people and carted off women, mainly women, as hostages for a, an oncoming war. Uh, the several things that seem to make absolutely no sense about this, and this is what kind of uh, got me initially, and, and it got a lot of people initially too. Uh, this made absolutely no sense. You know, like like the horror movies I was talking about in the previous section. This, this makes absolutely no sense from a variety of perspectives. Uh, first of all, uh, there is just the question of how. Uh, the the Gaza Strip, you know, as anyone knows, this is a, I mean, it's basically like the, the size of two moderately sized cities. Uh, you know, it, I think it's smaller than Manhattan, as a matter of fact. Maybe I'm getting the size of these things wrong, but this is a small area that's that's right on uh, the corner, uh, the the northwestern corner of Israel, uh, right right on its uh, boundaries with Sinai. I, I mean, this is this is an incredibly small piece of, of territory. It's, it's an incredibly blockaded piece of territory because it's currently ruled by Hamas, which is you know, a, an organization that, while kind of technically elected, and who cares about elections, but technically has the, the mandate of the people. While technically elected, this, this area was, um, is well known to be controlled by Hamas, uh, which is an enemy of Israel, and which has, in, in numerous other conflicts, openly participated in attacking Israel via rockets. And for the last 10 years, since the last conflict with, with Gaza, I think it's been about 10 years since the last conflict. Wasn't it 2011 or so when, when there was a flare-up? There was another big one in 2006 before this, right after Ariel Sharon uh, moved the settlers out of Gaza. 
But Israel has been touting that it had a state-of-the-art security system. It had a wall. It had an iron dome. It had spies everywhere. The Mossad operatives, I mean, everyone knows this on the right wing, or at least that's the propaganda, is that the Mossad is just everywhere, watching everything everyone does. And yet, somehow, with very little resources, I guess resources coming in from Iran, a lot of supporters in Saudi Arabia, a lot of weapons on the black market thanks to the current conflicts in Eastern Europe. But still, out of almost nowhere, Hamas was able to launch a comprehensive attack on these fortifications. None of the security, none of the spy networks, I mean, they, they, they did their usual thing where the risk of a security breach is unusually high this time of year, blah, blah, blah. And of course, no, no one takes it. It's like a, a, fire, a, a fire alarm that goes off every five seconds, right? And I don't mean the kind that happens because you haven't changed the batteries. I'm talking about the kind, uh, you know, the, the, the broken fire alarm or the broken car alarm that's constantly going off. You, you never check it because it's almost always a false alarm. But th there was no advance warning in a way that the security systems could, the security services could actually use. And so for about two days, uh, apparently, Hamas fighters totally overwhelmed a small section of Israel with thousands and thousands of fighters killing a bunch of people and carting off a bunch of hostages. Uh, and of course, and this, this, of course, I should also point out, this is just when Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, Likud party member, notorious hardliner, not hardliner, I mean, whatever, uh, n notorious non-progressive, and, and um, how should I put this? Someone who does not govern within the parameters laid out by the State Department, how you should conduct good wars. Uh, he, he comes back into office, and, and immediately we have this, this war fresh off the presses. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> and, of, and of course, you know, what, what we're experiencing right now, what we've ex been experiencing for the past five days is, is just is, is, is a retaliation that's, that's, that's very, very large from the Israeli side. Uh, almost none of this is in itself particularly interesting. Uh, you, you could ask a bunch of questions about this. Like, why isn't the Israeli-Palestine conflict solved? What side should right-wingers in the West take in the Israel-Palestine conflict? Uh, those are interesting questions, and I might get on to answering them at some point. But uh, the, the real question has to do just with with the the, the reaction to this, this um, you know, this... This, this problem um, from the point of view of, of, of the West, because I'm, I'm still kind of grappling with, I'm kind of waiting for somebody, anybody, or, or just a group of people who, who, who stand up and say, I just, I don't want to be fake anymore. I actually, I want to live in reality. I, I want to actually address problems as they exist and not as they exist on social media. I know you guys are watching this on social media. Uh, but it's amazing because, and I'll give you an analogy. I know me and my wife, uh, well, I guess we don't really do this anymore. But, but one of the pastimes we do together is sort of retro game. We have a Super Nintendo. Uh, we have a Super Nintendo uh, system and we have like Mario and uh, Street Fighter. And uh, uh, sometimes for her birthday as gifts, like uh, for stocking stuffers, I like getting my wife like, uh, Nintendo cartridges. And again, we have not had time to do anything like this in the last year or so. Uh, but but one time I got her this game that I really remember like playing in the 1990s called U1 Squadron. And U1 Squadron was really fun because it was one of those uh, side-scroller shooters with the airplanes where you have this jet fighter and you have to shoot down all the other jet fighters. Uh, like Raiden, except I think Yuan Squadron was more of the side-scroller variety in, the, in that genre. And it also had kind of an interesting anime aesthetic that was r strangely early for a video game, right? You didn't have many video games in the 90s that had anime aesthetics for, for Super Nintendo. So I get this game, you know, I, I find it at a used store uh, for very cheap. And it's a, it's somewhat of a collector's so I'm like, okay, oh my God, I found this game, right? I, I get it on, I plug it in. And not only does the game not work, the game stomps the entire Super Nintendo from working. 
uh, for a week. Like it's, it, it, and you know, I, I blow it out. I blow Super Nintendo out. It does not work. It causes the entire TV system to man- malfunction. And, and so it's just, it's just not working from, from a single contact with this game. I come back a week later. Okay, it plays Mario. Okay, it plays Street Fighter. I put you on Squadron again. The thing dies for two days again. Every time the cartridge goes in, and my wife, well, my wife joked and said that the thing has cartridge syphilis. And you put this cartridge in, and then the system just goes mm-hmm. completely insane. It, it loses track of itself. It, it, it goes nuts. Because that's no idea what to do. And not only does it not play you on Squadron, it doesn't play any other game because the entire thing is screwed up and it's lost. It's completely gone nuts. Um, this kind of reminds me of, of the Israel-Palestine conflict. It's the UN Squadron of the NPC mind. Because you plug this little thing in and uh, everyone goes completely insane. And they go insane, like, it's not even insane in, like, the usual ways where people, you know, heard her. For instance, like, people went insane when Roe v. Wade got overturned. Was anyone surprised about that? And not really. Not really, right? Because, I mean, everyone knew that if you're a progressive, that you don't like Roe v. Wade, you're going to march around, and that's completely understandable. That's completely consistent. But with the Israel-Palestine conflict, people just go nuts in in ways that take all of their previous opinions and and show them to be complete uh, gibberish. Uh, the, The... I, again, I'm still, I'm still not, I'm, 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 I, this is not exactly a very well planned out live stream or, or monologue because I'm, I'm still trying to process this. We could just go down the line. I mean, Jordan Peterson is now cheering on uh, a, a genocidal retaliation in, in the strongest words possible. Like, just absolute insanity coming out of this guy's mouth. Like, you know, he, he's talking about how they need to wipe them out, they need to finish them, go get them. BB Netanyahu acting like some kind of rabid uh, baseball crank sitting in the behind the Yankees bullpen, you know, shouting at the umpire how to do his job. <laughs> uh, just like complete, like boomer spurg out, absolutely no self control, absolutely no self awareness. Ben Shapiro, um, talking about if 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 we don't come in and support Israel then there's going to be nuclear war because Israel is just going to, I don't know what, they're just going to fire nukes indiscriminately at people or something. I don't know. Is this, this is, and this is conservative. This is the conservative perspective, right? Because if you don't support Israel, uh, then, then you're, then you're a, a, a crazy, then, 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 then the rational response is to threaten a nuclear winter by firing random nuclear missiles everywhere. I, I, these people have gone completely nuts and somewhat, sometimes it's understandable. I mean, you you see someone like um, the woman from the Libs of Tech Talk. It's a great example. I mean, look, she comes from an Orthodox Jewish family. I don't want to be misogynistic, but she is a, a woman. She's of the fairer sex. She sees her people being attacked. Her natural reaction is going to be, must defend my own people. And in this way, women are sort of natural conservatives and you don't watch the libs of TikTok because you expect to get some kind of mature philosophy about the world. You watch libs of TikTok because uh, you just want, I, mean, I don't know why people watch libs of TikTok. I guess you watch libs of TikTok to be outraged, to, to see exactly how far the public schools have fallen hiring these insane teachers about what the latest gender insanity is, what, what the contradictions are as they pile up inside the modern academy. I guess that's why you watch the libs of TikTok. But, but you understand that this woman is, 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 has a reactionary and hysterical tendency already. And it's not the most unhealthy thing for, for a woman to, to see her own people attacked and then suddenly want to have a retaliation, a strong defense and strong men to come to her aid. But the problem is, is that every single conservative, uh, you know, personality acts like hysterical women. They, they act like hysterical women looking at this. Like they, they have, they've completely dropped their rationality, dropped any kind of understanding of the world historical context in which it exists. And it's not even like the recommendations are, are necessarily bad. I and mean, that you could justify war for this. You could justify not going to war for, for the terrorist acts in Israel. It's just how they approach it. They shriek. 
They shriek. And Jordan Peterson he just shrieks into the Twitter machine. Ben Shapiro is shrieking like a woman into into the into the Twitter machine, and, and, and it's performative and hysterical and, and unreal. It's detached, and then you have to watch every single person. And this is another thing that came that came up too. We were. Just a few weeks ago, and this has been a continuous conversation going on, I, I kind of got into it with a bunch of, of the people on the Christian nationalist versus anti-Christian nationalist side of things. And this is obviously something that I'm a, I'm a, I, I shouldn't really have a dog in this fight, so to speak, because I don't like nationalism. I'm not a Protestant, which in Christian nationalism is predominantly a Protestant ideology, or I mean, it's. It's, it's largely a controversy inside Protestantism or evan evangelical Protestantism to be specific. Uh, I'm not a nationalist. I am not Protestant. So I shouldn't have a dog in this fight. Uh, but, but still, the, the problem is, is that the anti-Christian anti national... Now, the other reason I shouldn't have a dog in this fight is I hate, hate, hate this this modern evangelical tendency to take classic Christian ideas, which all Christians have believed forever, and then repackage them into like your own personal little brand that's that that's sold to people as if it's a new idea. We shouldn't defend old practices that are thousands of years old as new ideas because in the process of doing that, it causes, it, it sheds, it, it creates more heat than it does light. It creates more heat than it does light. And you stir up a bunch of controversy when you really shouldn't. You mean you really should be striving for clarity because controversy only helps our enemies. But despite the fact that I shouldn't have a dog in this fight, uh, the, the anti-Christian nationalist side on the evangelical side has been so hysterical and so self-righteous and so historical and so willing to go in for historical and theological absurdities that I, I felt like I've just had to weigh in on this. And as a consequence, I've gotten into a number of debates with these people and I've invited all of them onto this channel to have a debate over Christian nationalism, not really Christian nationalism per se, but the principles that undergird it, which are again, just the principles that all Christians have had. To, to war and to, to nationhood and to nation building and to the wielding of power forever. I should, I should just say classic Christian politics. I always invite them on. They always refuse. Every now and again, one of their followers comes on and we have a, a private discussion because I don't want to put, you know, somebody with, with a 30, with a, a 30 follower Twitter account on blast. And, and what, what, what you talk with these people either on Twitter or in person for these smaller people, and, and immediately you get this idea that, that that these people are essentially promoting what we would classically call an Anabaptist perspective or sort of a Mennonite perspective on politics. And the perspective is like Christ did not wield politics. Christ was his kingdom was not of this world. So this implicitly creates uh, a duty for Christians to stay out of politics or promoting their religion through politics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The problem, as I've mentioned many times before, is that this is that this withdrawal from politics is 100% tactical. These people, in one moment, these anti-Christian nationalists will say, well, we can never have Christian principles guide the nation state because Christ's kingdom was not of this earth, given to Caesar what is Caesar's, et cetera, et cetera. You should abstain from power. You should withdraw from the world. But then the next moment, they're perfectly willing to get behind Republican candidates to go in for ordinary politics, to even preach about social justice causes and anti-racist causes, if you're uh, if you're Russell Moore. And and uh, so so they're wielding politics. Then when it comes to the actual classic application of politics, then all of a sudden we're supposed to be monks or Mennonites or people who completely abstain from political practice at all. <laughs> Okay, I mean, but this, are, are they thinking? Who knows? Who cares? But I'll tell you this, every one of these people who was totally anti-Christian nationalist for the past two weeks in the past now comes out this week and, and tells me that, that, that protection of the Jewish state in Israel 
is an imperative for Christians. Like this, this is just war theory. This is social justice. This is our calling. We have to do the right thing. This is a hard truth. They use the same language for everything. Oh my God. You know, this, this is a real cause worth fighting for. Okay. So all of a sudden, maybe power isn't impossible for Christians to defend. What makes, what makes Israel a just cause worthy to fight for? But the cause of a Christian nation or a Christian Senate or a Christian prince completely forbidden. <laughs> it can't possibly be the nationalism. It can't possibly be the existence of a religious state. It can't even possibly be the existence of an ethno-nationalist state, since all you guys are now currently right here in front of me endorsing a nationalist, ethno-nationalist, and religiously ethno-nationalist state in its current contest. Fine. <laughs> Fine. We're going to do that. We're, we're going to have this insanity. And of course, there's no explanation. There's no there's no conversation. There, there's no reconciliation between these facts. There's no ability to come to terms with this contradiction because they're not interested in having a conversation. They're not interested in it making sense. They're just interested in it being a tweet that goes viral for this 24-hour period. And then we're dropped off in the mode of complete incoherency. It almost feels like the attack itself was a tweet. The, the Hamas, it's, I don't feel like Hamas, they invaded the lower part of Israel, but there was no tactical point to the invasion. There was no, I, mean, I guess hostages was the point. I, I guess, I guess maybe the idea was somehow there would be, there would be an exchange of hostages with Benjamin Netanyahu, a person who famously does not negotiate in this way for hostages with Hamas. Maybe they thought the backlash coming from Israel would be greater and there would be benefit that way somehow. Uh, that's a possibility. But but more than anything else, when I'm watching the actual attack, all I can think of is this is a fucking meme. This is this is the meme war. Uh, they, they literally parachuted into this place with AK-47 so they could generate a bunch of fucking memes and post them on social media. The, the 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 Hamas attack on Israel makes more sense as a social media campaign than it does an actual war or an actual military movement because the only consequence of this materially is that the material side of Hamas is going to suffer more physical destruction than it will any kind of, of, of benefit it gets on the battlefield from a momentary incursion. The retaliation is obviously going to destroy more. It's a meme. We're doing a meme. We're, we're doing a meme because we want to raise the profile of this issue, because we want to create chaos on the world stage, because we want to actually uh, stir the pot a little bit, because we know that simply from things moving around, from being shaken up, we're likely to get more out of this politically than we are from having any kind of sanity to any movement whatsoever. So we, we have insane people doing shit, killing people, an insane response with no end. And none of these things have any end responses. Right now, Israel is bombing Gaza. What's the end game for this? What, what is the? I know what Israel wants the end game to be. Israel wants to ethnically cleanse the Gaza Strip, and it wants Western nations to take these these refugees, quote unquote, as you know, as refugees from a war zone, forgetting for a moment that they were expelled from Gaza because they could not safely live next to Israelis. Somehow now. All of these Gazans are going to safely live next to British people and Swedes and Danish people and Germans. I, I know that's what Israel wants, but there's no coherent way to get that. There's no sane way to argue that. There, there's no way that anybody could sit down at the table with, with a conscious mind in his head and then negotiate from first principles or even from a negotiating point of view, even from a quid pro quo negotiating uh, standpoint. There's no way that you could get to Gazans are too dangerous to live next to Israel. Let's have them live in France. There, there's no sane way for this policy to be proposed or or accepted. So so we're just going to stir the pot until it happens naturally because we'll just do insane things until it happens naturally. We'll do insane things because everyone else is doing insane things and everyone else is being led around by algorithms. They'll keep on doing insane shit until we end up with the worst possible scenario imaginable, which has no logic external to itself, and that won't even stop the conflict to begin with. It won't even resolve the conflict between Israel and the other Arab states. Oh, and maybe I forgot another group. Maybe we forgot the left, too. I mean, we shouldn't forget about the... I mean, 
Good, good Lord. I mean, I don't know what to say about the left right now because it appears to be completely divided. And this is one reason why if I were a right winger right now, I wouldn't. I mean, I don't know why anybody on the right wing is taking a position on this conflict at all. Because right now, as we speak, almost the entirety of the left that had any kind of moderate persuasions or a reason to support the existence of a Jewish state to begin with, which is a significant amount of the body of the left, has now gone full in on Israel's own ethno-nationalist project and its sacred defense of that ultra-nationalist ethno-nationalist project. Conversely, the side of the left, the more radical side of the left, the more philosophically consistent side of the left, has not actually... I mean... Obviously, the more philosophically consistent side of the left is looking for an eventual global homogenization of nations and culture. The John Lennon's Imagine Universe, where everyone can get along with everything. Where everyone can get along and, and everyone can be equally deracinated, everyone can be equally participatory in this polymorphic perversity that, that is human hedonic uh, fulfillment. That, that is the highest calling. That, that's, that's the left in its purest form. Uh, the problem is that there is no discussion about how to get to this place uh, of hedonic perfection, the way that leftists and their John Lennon incarnation imagine it. Because this reality is obviously not part of this meme cycle. This, this reality is obviously not part of this current thing, nor is it an imaginable uh, endpoint to this reality. No one can imagine any state that resolves from Israel and Palestine's conflict getting measurably closer to the big gay homogenated super state that is that is the end point of utopian leftist thinking. So instead, everyone who's not enthralled to the Israeli ethno-nationalist project has now become enthralled to the anti-colonial or decolonization ethno-nationalist project. And, and you, you have all of those guys going around and and shouting and shouting things like oh well, well this is this is time for mass decolonization it's land back time guys land back all right i mean <laughs> every time i hear land back i this is a big thing in bread tube too and this is how you can tell the true believers from the cynics because the true believers if you actually you know when i, when I say true believers i mean true believers in the real world so i mean okay where does land back come from? Where, where do things like land acknowledge? So land back means that we're going to give, we're going to give the land back to people who lost it during colonization, which is not, I mean, of all the leftist ideas, this is one of the least crazy ones in so far is that things like this is, have actually occurred. In, in fact, there has been a little bit of a land back movement occurring between Armenia and Arshabrazan uh, four weeks ago and nobody cared, where Arshabrazan essentially ethnically cleansed an entire area of their own country of ethnically ethnic Armenians and sent them packing across the border into Armenia. Uh, very few people commented on this, uh, called it out as a colonial project or an anti-colonial project. The left didn't want to touch it. The right didn't care about it. Uh, although I'm sure th I knew a few right-wing Armenians who were certainly not happy about this and, and, a, and a call for a response from Christendom, if it existed in a real political way, you could argue might have been warranted in some way, shape, or form. But regardless of the fact it happened, this is, you know, land back for all of its other problems is not an insane idea. But, but I, do, I do use it to, to, to distinguish between the frauds and, and the real people. So I'll give you an example, like Vosh versus versus someone like Thought Slime. These are two bread tubers. Uh, Thought Slime is a uh, he's he's almost kind of a lol cow because he looks exactly like you would imagine a left wing Canadian bread tuber. He's he's like short and got this incredibly like weird fat jaw uh, that makes him look simultaneously very masculine and, and very young. And uh, he combines with a, with, his, with a non binary personality that makes absolutely no sense. Every second sentence out of his mouth is a self deprecation, calling himself out for being white and, and calling out his own privilege while at the same time asking you to give money on Patreon for his, his art, right? But, but I'll, and, and you know, everyone knows Vosh and, and the rest of the debate me bro culture like Hassan. Thought Slime is very notably for the whole land back idea. That you're, you're literally going to give the, this land back. Vosh is against it because uh, land back is, you know, uh, well, I want, 
I want social justice for all BIPOC people, all First Nations people, all people of color in the West. I'm deeply committed to that. But but land back sounds too much like ethno-nationalism. Right. And, and and that is actually a sensical position. On paper, Vosh has the, the what would be sort of the ordinary interpretation, the left wing vision of a completely deracinated world of hedonic pleasure. Correct. That that is the that is the correct answer if you want to be consistent with the deracinated world of hedonic pleasure. That's described in things like John Lennon's Imagine or in every socialist pamphlet from the 19th century or, you know, from the early 20th century Fabians. Bosch has the technically correct answer on paper. It still marks him as a fraud because it marks him as a fraud because if, as I know Thought Slime has done, if you in the real world participate in leftist activism and you go to these organizations and you talk, you participate in all their little communal circles and their, and their voting. And they, they always have, I've, I was a progressive for years and for at least two or three years in that time being a progressive, I was all into this co-op participatory democracy thing. And they do this all the time. They sit you down in these little circles and they have like a discussion, a conversation, a dialectic, a dialogue. But of course, all of this is, it's, it's a complete pantomime, right? That the, the microphone gets passed back and forth between a, a few notable speakers and their friends who are pre-selected because they, they rank particularly high on, on the oppression hierarchy, so to speak. They, they rank particularly high uh, on, on the progressive stack. And, and of course, if you're a white man like me, you just, you, or it wasn't, and you know, back in the day, like in 2000 and, in, seven 2008 when i was into this stuff like it wasn't this wasn't that big of a deal like the progressive stack wasn't so brutally enforced so you could still get a chance to talk a little bit but you no know, most of the time is dominated by people that have for lack of a better word third world or, or non-white interests and non-white perspectives and, and what comes out of this is uh, what 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 you see, what you hear, if you take this earnestly, and what dominates the mic in these conversations are, are frankly speaking, uh, third world ethno nationalism, uh, which is what these people want when you give them a microphone and give them power. They don't want a deracinated world of hedonism. Uh, they they don't want they don't want a a world that the white socialists would imagine where everything is controlled by systems, and where you can express yourself in forty two different colors. Uh, they want political power and they want political power to be granted specifically to their own individual community. And their goal throughout this entire struggle session, and these things usually devolve into a struggle session, is to essentially put this desire for explicit ethno-nationalism into a language that translates well uh, to, to progressive priorities of grievance politics. Nobody can enter into one of these places and, and take what they're saying seriously without coming out of it having an incredibly large sense of white guilt and an incredible dedication to some kind of third world activist cause like land back. Uh, li let's literally give the land back to the native peoples. Um, <laughs> and this is kind of this, this is the classic insane religion, right? It's an classic saying in religion because the only reason why this perception can exist in the minds of these people is that it's transparently fake and it's transparently a lie. So the entire system works by building up this impression that you're working towards ethno-nationalism for these non-white peoples and increasingly builds this, this, this idol of the divine other, the divine BIPOC personality in the minds of the white people there. But the policy is completely cynical. The land acknowledgement goes on every university now, every single place I go to these days. When I went to see a classical music concert in my hometown when I was back a few months ago, it opened up with a land acknowledgement. <laughs> you know, and this is this is now just de rigueur in California. This is de rigueur in, I mean, it's been de rigueur in, in Canada for actually almost a decade now. A land acknowledgement, a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge that this is the property of the tribe X, of the tribe Y. Why aren't you giving it back? Why? Aren't, I mean, and every time they announce that, every time the administrators and the owners of a college acknowledge that they're doing this on stolen land of some tribe, uh, the, 
it just highlights the the falsity of, of the religion because they're they're not land backing it. They're not giving they're not giving the land over to the tribes. They're not giving this land back to people. Uh, the, the entire pre and it's so obvious that they aren't. And so and so now my Twitter feed is filled with all of these rich white progressives who have bitten the bullet and have gone full in on on, on decolonization across the board everywhere. These are rich boomers now who are on board this stuff. Okay, this is the last draw. We're going full land back. Okay, man, what's your next move? What's your next move in this land back thing? I mean, if you're a boomer, maybe it's easy. Maybe the move for boomers is just to land back their entire kids' inheritance into the hands of these NGO organizations. That might be a compromise that could actually happen. Although the ultimate losers are going to be, well, millennials and Gen Xers and and the children that come up of age in the next generation because that money's not coming back. But what, what's your next move? It's, it's a completely fault. Has anyone actually thought about this? This is literally, I mean, this is why I call this, this is the cartridge that's going to break the system. I, I, I wonder, like, is there a single person on Twitter? I haven't, I don't think I've seen a single person on Twitter outside of sort of my narrow reactionary sphere where, where I exist you know, and some radicals who really embrace things on, on either the far communist left or the, or the far ultranationalist right. Other than those guys, I have not seen a single position that's going to just stop the machine from working. So, you know, the famous meme of, of the current thing, NPC guy, where you take the cartridge out, you know, it's COVID or it's Black Lives Matter. You take it out and then you put the Ukraine cartridge in and he goes, new current thing. I am for Ukraine. And then now, now all of a sudden, you know, you're going to take the Ukraine cartridge out. And you're going to put the Israel-Palestine cartridge in. The Israel-Palestine cartridge, in this case, is like the UN squadron cartridge in my own collection. You put this thing in, and the system isn't going to work in the future. I can't think of a single person online who, who has stated a position on this conflict that is remotely ideologically coherent with anything else they believe. That's remotely, I mean, okay, land back. You're going to land back. Okay, maybe you're going to take away all my family's property in California or my parents' property in California, as I'm not currently, I don't currently own property in California. You're going to take away all my parents' property in California. Maybe all my property because we're horrible white colonists that came here after World War II and bought up a piece of California land when California land was cheap. Uh, okay, am I going to show up in Eastern Europe and then land back all of the Serbs and Slavs that currently exist in the plot of land where my father grew up? Land back has to stop somewhere. So all land back motions are implicitly a call that some people have the right for. And, and you know, white progressives know this. White progressives fully understand that white people can't be allowed to land back other people, even if the claim is 100% legitimate. Nobody, nobody's going to allow Greeks to show up in Constantinople and land back the Turks. Nobody's going to allow Germans to show up in Poland and land back Gdansk. Nobody is going to allow, nobody is going to allow like Scotch Irish people who currently live in, I don't know, Tennessee, they get land back by the Cherokee and next thing they show up in Ulster and land back whatever the fuck lives in Ulster. <laughs> I mean, everyone, the, the problem with all of this is that any one of these positions that's currently being promoted on, on Twitter is completely incoherent. It's implicitly ethno-nationalist and everyone knows this. And it shows a lie to everything else they say in the future. And nobody can possibly believe this. Nobody can possibly believe this. <laughs> um, I, I'm just so, so sick of, of, of this stuff. I, I'm so sick in how we interact with war. And I understand that everything was at some point, at some point war was always a spectator sport i mean obviously the first gulf war was commented as sort of a television event on cnn for for most people uh, but in the age of social media now all of a sudden people think that they're actually participating in these wars uh, the ukraine one was i mean I, I you saw this a little bit in the arab spring i should say perhaps arab spring was the the iteration 1.0 of this this phenomenon 
Like, okay, we have a new thing, a, a new war that is the current thing. And it's not a Republican war. It's not one of those bad wars that we have to oppose because we don't want the United States to be an interventionist power. This intervention that is the Arab Spring is, is a good war. And now it's, it's our job to go participate in it on social media, on Twitter. And so now you have, you have a group of people who are professing loyalties to these signs. I mean, they're, they're, they're running the flags up. I'm see all throughout Princeton, all throughout the liberal cities of New Jersey, Ukrainian flag after Ukrainian flag, protests up and down the college yard with Ukrainian flags, anti-Putin flags. I'm sure. Okay, great. You know, I'm sure that Putin has his vacation home in Trenton. You know, just let's just pop on down to Rutgers. I'm sure some of the Russian military are there. It's going to be super relevant, guys, right? But this this pantomime for for a war that that nobody here is participating in, and, and that which no one will will remember two months from now, three months from now. I mean, the Ukraine lore is probably going to be lost by Ukraine. I think that was it's pretty much what's happening right now, is the Ukraine war is going out of the news, and definitively it looks like. Insofar as there is any winner in that war, it certainly isn't Ukraine. So what happens to the current thing when it dies? What happens? I, I, I hate this. I hate this horrible response. I hate this. I hate the fact that it turns us all into fake people. Uh, last week, I, or not last week, but last one I did one of these podcasts, I commented on counterpoints. Counterpoints the debate bro, and really all debate pros, who I'm sure like counterpoints, he was a soldier. I think he fought in the Iraq war, maybe Afghanistan. He may have seen combat. He certainly knows what it is like to be part of a military unit. Apparently he's also ex-security as well. He has some understanding of what it means to be put in the line of danger, I assume. I know that this person has some kind of maturity when it comes to that. When he gets online, he becomes a completely fake person who can't even remember or take seriously active political issues that are putting us in danger, that are impoverishing us in this moment. We had that whole incidence of that, that Troons person, that, that the trans announcer for Ukraine talking about blood and soil nationalism, meanwhile subverting nationalism for America. It, it, the priority of all of these social media sites is to create people that have no internal substance to them whatsoever. You couldn't respect this. Like if someone was like this as a friend and they oscillated like this in your day-to-day life with this amount of impermanence, uh, you would think that they were insane. You'd never want to befriend these people. Okay, okay, man. You know, you were threatening to murder me last week because we supported opposite sides of the Israel-Palestine conflict. But now this week, now that that's no longer the current thing, you're you're my friend again. And people... (laughs) And people have... I've lost an enormous number of friendships over political issues, over the fact that I didn't go along with the current thing. But now I'm supposed to believe that that nobody has the ability to, or, or even desire to be at all consistent with this? I mean, <laughs> I'm kind of a lock of work. What are we doing? What is anybody doing? With these, with these, with these circumstances, we find ourselves in. Like, wh- where are the adults in the room? We're led by just these senile government fixtures, and all of these people do is just try to keep the machine going. There's no ownership. There's no understanding of the reality of what's going on. I mean, let's maybe we should just address this first of all, right? Okay. There's two questions people constantly ask me. I mean, they didn't really ask this because they know for a fact that I hate answering these questions. You know, what is the solution to the Israel-Palestine conflict? And what is the proper, what's what's the proper side of the Israel-Palestine conflict? Maybe answering them in reverse order. There's no right side. There's no proper side. There's no good side in the Israel-Palestine conflict. These are two people that are fighting that in the classic sense, in the classic political understanding of the world, they're fighting over a piece of land. 
Now, before the 20th century, we understood that pieces of land were held by particular peoples, not others. We forgot that in the 20th century. In the 20th century, we understood that ultima ratio regnum, the last argument of kings was war and that politics was an extension of war. Before the 20th century, we understood we understood that no people is innocent and that all people have histories of violence. Now, that's not to say that people didn't recognize barbarians like the Mongols and couldn't distinguish them from non-barbarians like the Chinese. But there wasn't this somehow there wasn't this idea somehow that pursuant to a massacre or pursuant to some kind of war crime committed by a general or a specific actor or a government that 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 necessarily made you the person who was the oppressor and therefore the bad guy in the Marvel movie that played out. That, or that, that seems like all 20th century conflicts have to be portrayed in the mode of a Marvel movie. The only way to properly conceptualize this is two people fighting over a piece of land. One people does not have the power to hold it, namely Pal the Palestinians. One does. The problem is, is that the party that does not have the power to hold it is being supported by an apparatus of nationalist networks. And the side that does have the power to hold it, A, is pursuing a humiliating poll. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of how Israel has conducted itself in this region in the sense that it has pursued by its own means a humiliating project of, of nationalism and of sort of subverting native Arab governments, uh, not to put too fine a point on it, and, and destabilizing native Arab governments for the ultimate plan of their future security. The only way this problem gets solved is if you have some incredibly powerful sovereign come in, divide the territories, and shut down Israel's ability to destabilize the region with a completely stabilized Middle East and a, a Middle East that is set up with proper boundaries and understanding that these boundaries do not move and with political orders that are not democratically based, which is the only way you can manage this region, I'm convinced. That's the only way that you can have a lasting peace, which necessarily involves there not being good guys or bad guys in any of this thing. Someone said this reminds you of fantasy football or this reminds you of a sports game. And I'm going to get to that later, I guess, because I'm going to talk a little bit about that. The problem is with all of these things, with all of these Israel versus Palestine concepts, is that it's implicitly involved in a weird kind of proxy nationalism for America. Uh, for, for the West in general, the third world, thir even third world nationalism or, or progressives, progressives understanding of their own worldview. N nobody, and this is what people don't understand, like progressives who aren't as delusional as someone like Thought Slime or as, or as nakedly cynical as someone like Vosh, they, they all know that this John Lennon's Imagine thing isn't going to happen. Uh, people like ContraPoints, they, they know this John Lennon thing isn't going isn't to happen. The thing that they're clinging on to is their identity as people who are on the winning side of the culture war. They are they identify as cosmopolitans. What does cosmopolitan mean? And there's this is cosmopolitan leftism or cosmopolitan progressive. This has been something that's been a motif throughout the. I don't even remember who was the first person. There was some famous person who identified his politics as just being cosmopolitan and then with no qualifier they themselves are nationalists of a completely hypothetical country of progressivism they are part of the post national progressive nation that exists in all other nations and to that end all other peoples must be humiliated and colonized either that are used as pawns in an ongoing era of humiliation 
every destabilizing war is a method of doing this, as a method of actually using this as an entertainment product. Every single new current thing is a new vanity project, a new vanity fixture of this cosmopolitan religion. What kind of falls as an imperative to the people who are not progressive is to kind of answer this. Okay, so we want to talk about Israel and Palestine. Can we talk about who we are before any of this happens? Before any of this happens, I want to know who you are. Before you tell me how much we need to support Israel. Oh my God, I can't, I can't believe how many times people like this horrible neocon, David Marcus, and I, I do kind of have it out for this person. He and I had a, a few interactions back in 2018 that I was not very happy with. He starts going on about how Israel has always been a friend of Christendom. It's always been, you know, Israel and the West have been always one in the same struggle against the Muslim hordes at Constantinople, during the Roman Empire, during all of the West's heights, Jews and Christians have been in one common project, and that project is Christendom. Christendom? I mean, I kind of just, I, I, who, who believes this? David Marcus does not believe this. Who believes, okay, okay, great. All right, I'm supposed to support Israel because of Christendom, because Israel supports Christendom. When was the last time any Jewish leader has openly said, oh yeah, Christendom, we support that, or we acknowledge that this is an, a political entity that needs to exist or should exist or does exist? In order for there to be any kind of alliance, I would need to understand who is on my side. Christendom as a feature for David Marcus only exists under the circumstances that he needs an excuse to defend Israel. His nationalism is a completely hypothetical nationalism to a nation and a religion that he isn't to support otherwise, that he actively seeks to subvert otherwise in any, almost any other circumstance for completely libertarian ends. Oh, Dan Carlin. Dan Carlin, our, our Trump derangement, our hardcore history guy, he says, well, we have to have nationalism for Israel. Otherwise, what will happen is that Arabs will move to Israel and then through the power of the ballot box, they'll be able to take it over, subvert it demographically, weaponize democracy. Democracy can be weaponized? Dan Carlin believes that? Demographics is a threat to the existence of a nation's continuation. And then we have the myriad of conservatives who hit all the right notes when it comes to the culture war. They want to use Israel as a proxy for their interests. I don't have any problem with Israel. I don't have any problem with a Jewish state or multiple Jewish states in various areas of the world. But it's an irrelevant point. It's a point that I can't possibly answer. I can't possibly answer this because I don't have a people. I always like to say, and I got this from, ironically enough, the people did Murdoch Murdoch. If you're pro me, I'm pro you. That's the extension that I always want to offer anybody from any country, where, wherever I meet them. If you are for me and my family and my religion, then I want to offer you the same courtesy, offered in the spirit in which yours was given. That is the universal mark of the gentleman and the civilized family and how we all should be looking to conduct ourselves in, 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 in all times, war or times of peace. What, what I'm never going to do, though, is I'm never going to, and this is what, what I think conservatives need to keep in mind, I, I'm never going to bend my knee in loyalty 
to a proxy of someone else's people, when I can't definitively tell myself or my community, who is the proxy and symbol of my own people? Who are the people that are going to be carrying forward our traditions and our promises? Other than the arrangements that I personally make with my family, the arrangements that I personally make with my property, who is the sovereign that guides my people? Who are the elders that make sure that the traditions are carried on in the future? Because until that's established, I don't have a people. So here am I looking at what you have as Palestinians, as Arabs, as Turks, as Palestinians, as Israelis, as Sephardic Jews. And I'm going to not just give you the personal respect that I said was available to anyone in the first part of, of the sentence. If you are pro me, I'm pro you. I'm going to additionally dedicate some kind of sacred sense to, to this political identity without having an understanding of my own or having leaders that are completely subversive to this. I haven't answered the fundamental question of identity. For me to have a right to answer that, I'm kneeling before you in some manner, and I'm, if not, if not dedicating my own child's blood to your cause, dedicating the blood of my neighbors in the military, or maybe of mercenaries, the treasure of my people, the, the tax dollars. And I can't even count, I can't even tell if this respect has been reciprocated. Because it can't be. Because virtually everybody asking me to support either Israel or Palestine, virtually everyone cannot look at me and tell me who my people are. Because according to them, I don't have a people. I never have had a people, and I never should have a people. And any constructive impression of myself that's positive and geared towards the preservation of a collective in a real political sense is de facto illegitimate. No such, and this applies to Pal, and this applies to the far right wingers who are going in for Palestine too. Your antipathy towards specific Jews or specific Israelis who have harmed you in the past is not a sufficient reason to oppose their collectivity. It's imprudent. It's unwise. It exposes you to attack, and it gets you nothing. It gets you nothing because you're acting like a sovereign. You're pretending to be a sovereign when you're not when we're all just individuals, when we have no political organization, when we have no conception of ourselves. We're part of a nation that no longer exists, that only exists as an apparatus of government to keep a machine going, to keep a certain economic and monetary system going and chugging along. And that system, that God we have created, that is the 20th century secular society, the open world, the open society it's supposed to, we're all supposed to be moving into, it's dying because it does not have the requisite elements to keep itself afloat. What's the reason why the Gaza conflict is happening? The reason why the Gaza conflict is happening is because everyone knows that United States power is in steep decline. And they understand that military campaigns don't need to make sense for them to ultimately benefit the system, if you're a person that benefits from having decline accelerate. The Gaza attacks were put into place to accelerate the process that's already going on, that everyone can see going on just by turning on their televisions. Was there any overarching plan? Not particularly. I don't think so. I don't see it. Was there any particular endpoint to this all other than shaking the pot? other than, I should say, stirring the pot, as the expression goes, other than shaking the bottle or stirring the pot. I'm a horrible mixed metaphor person here. <laughs> I don't think so. But, but everyone can see that the god is dying. And this is what just frustrates, it frustrates me to no end. It frustrates me to no end. And I guess this kind of gets to the heart of my own talk about about what I've been thinking about recently and the, 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 the sort of the Halloween season we've been in. I, I do feel 
there is something a little bit special about October. And then I feel like we kind of have a way to process our situation a little bit better than we typically do. Something puts us in in the mood of, of meditating on 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 the things that have dead that are dead and dying and that have gone before us and that will never return. And, and part of these things is just the old American order. There is this really great um excuse me a minute here. Recently, there's this really great set of, and maybe I don't know if I should segue into this or not, but almost all of our problems on the right are generation and generational in origin. We do not have a class of baby boomers that cooperate with our ends, and they're entirely delusional to what's actually needed. They think that there's this thing called America. They think there's this thing called the American concept. They think that there is this culture that just is overpowering and that's gonna subsume everyone and assimilate them into a common mode of being. This God is dead. Uh, and the machine God that currently exists in its place is slowly running down. Everyone can hear the tick-tock of its heart slowly tick down again and again and again. <laughs> I can see my wife saying, oh my God, this is depressing. And we're in the shadow of this dying God, very consciously, feeling the powers that once were at their prime ebb away. And I'm just waiting for somebody, I'm waiting for the next generation or some significant group of people to wake up and realize this and act like they actually have a desire to carry on their line into the future. One of my friends, uh, Bennett, who goes by the name Extra Dead JCB, who runs the exit group is currently hosting this thing called the natalism conference natalism conference he was on alex kashuta just the other day although the interview hasn't come out of the paywall just yet uh this conference got a lot of mainstream notice it was run in slate a few days ago and a few other one of these right-wing watch organizations are like oh my god there's there's this horrible natalism conference that's going on and i think it's like phoenix arizona or something like that or no, i think it's austin texas i apologize it's a much nicer place than phoenix arizona i had very bad experiences when i went to phoenix arizona i i could tell you a story one time it was like it was like watch walking into a a, a decline civilization automatically it was it was bizarre um, but, but all these scurpies, oh my God, oh my God, this, this ultra right-wing conference that's going on about, about being pro-natalism. And then, you know, you hear Bennett coming on talk about this and he's like, well, he has, he's, he, the, Bennett himself is Mormon, extra, extra dead JCB is Mormon. I don't know if I, I, I think his first name is Kyle. Um, I'm not going to dox him, obviously. But the, uh, he gets on to Alex Kishida and he has this very friendly Mormon way of, of talking. And he, he says, well, Alex, you know, I, I think we just need to kind of focus on solutions. What can we all get around and agree to to make society a better place? I think the fundamental thing is let's just keep on existing. Let's just, can we all agree on that? <laughs> can we all agree that we want to exist in the future? In Japan and Korea, apparently, uh, in Korea in particular, their birth rate's so low and they're so advanced into the process that they basically resign themselves to not have a next generation. Nobody's getting married. Nobody's having children. And moreover, nobody talks about it. But now we get scare pieces about the, about the scary right-wing conference whose only prerequisite belief is we want to keep on existing as human beings. We want to keep our people alive. And that's an insane right-wing concept in 2023. And it's insane in a right-wing concept because to acknowledge the fact that even being alive is under threat, you have to point to the fact that the God of the American order and, and the God that reigns, I mean, this is the thing with South Korea. South Korea knows that it's dying 
And there's a prohibition on talking about it because by talking about it, all hell would break loose. The gods of chaos would be given power. The primordial forces would be unleashed. I mean, it is a scary proposition to point out that the god is dead. But that's the only thing that we can do to kind of keep going forward. There's a series of great essays, and before I got on the stream, I was kind of reminded by them by a thread from, you know, I always think that this person's very popular and has thousands of subscribers, but she's actually a very small person on Twitter, or I guess X as it's called. Can we just settle on a mix between Twitter and X and call it Twix? That would be, I think that'd be a good name for it. We just call it, I'm going to go Twix for, I'm going to scroll Twix. That, that sounds good. Twitter X. But, but I was reminded, so Johan Kurtz writes this blog called Becoming Noble. And I met him at the Witton conference about a month and a half ago. And he was by far my favorite presenter at the conference. He had a wonderful speech and I gained a lot from it. But he's had a series of amazing Substack articles about a variety of different things. The most primary one that I remember, and I, I want to kind of look them up right now, is about sports. Or about, or about spectator sports. Um, because inside spectator sports, we see sort of like, we see in microcosm the path of a dying god takes. All right, so and I, here I'm heavily plagiarizing from Johann Kurtz's article, and actually two articles about sports. But I'm moving towards my own point here, because sports is in microcosm what is... Western civilization and macrocosm. What what was professional sports to begin with? As professional sports was, you have a city. You have a city. And your city has a bunch of men in it. And the men become friends. They bond with each other by playing sports among each other, with each other, competitive games. And competitive games are how men bond, which is one of the reasons why I am... I mean, I am I do play tennis, although not competitively. I do like physical exercise, although I have a bum back, which oftentimes makes it difficult for me to get out as much as I like, and a very time-consuming sedentary job, which I, I really should look into leaving. But 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 I I, I played tennis competitively for one year in high school before I, I I got cut from the team, you know, in my junior year. Um, you know, so I, I'm familiar with the idea of competitive sports. I did competitive fencing afterwards to, to replace tennis. And, you know, I, I'm aware of the idea. Originally, the idea was sports was an extension of what we all know as high school sports. Like, the guys all play sports because it bonds them together as men. It helps them create a pecking order of competence. And it allows them to understand their rules as men inside a political group. Politics is hammered out. And in addition to politics being hammered out between men, it also gives women something to grasp onto. Women are looking for male hierarchies that translate into healthy political relationships. What women want more than anything else is a man that holds himself properly like a man who has a proper political understanding of himself as part of a community, who's able to take charge. And I'm not the best manager in the world. I I really should be taking more charge of things than, than I'm doing, but, but I'm learning about it. But that's what women look for. And sports is a perfect proxy of that. Furthermore, what sports allows towns to do inside a polity that's, that's not having a civil war, as it allows groups of young men to compete violently against other groups of men in contests of strength. And therefore, in the face of that, the, the sports becomes a spectator sport by which there, there's a religion of male vitality. Women use it to calibrate their own sexual instincts. The town or the locality uses it to calibrate their own understanding of intergenerational transmission. I played football for my town, and here I am handing the baton on to my son, who carries forward the, the proud tradition. And I hope that Yorkshire beats Lancaster County this year at, at, the, local, at the local soccer meet. I know they don't call it soccer in England, but whatever. Uh, you know, I don't want to say, you know, 
that that was the spirit of sports linking the generations creating a stand-in for war calibrating the sexual instincts of women calibrating the bonds of fraternity among men everything like that works as an organic organism in professional sports and, and this extends to colleges too right and in colleges the idea was colleges were a more specific branch i mean colleges didn't used to even be that large so almost everyone would either be on the fall ball team or be friends with somebody who was on, or at least acquaintances of the people who were on the football team. And, and, and the college tie to that sport would again be a way to bond yourself to other men. Uh, later, perhaps, women would bond to other women, but I don't think it necessarily works the same way for women, so I, I shouldn't say. But this is... This this is the spirit. This is why, you know, you can see everyone's out in Princeton this time of, or I guess a little bit earlier doing boating, right? Everyone's out there doing crew activities because that was how the college defined itself. They defined itself by crew, it defined itself by football. It defined itself and it's intergenerational. But now everything like that is absorbed into the simulacrum of professional sports. Nobody plays these sports. They're entirely spectator-driven. They're entirely fan-driven, and they're kind of a symbolism of a culture dissected in a, in a strange way. And this is something that Johann Kurtz brings up in, in the eminent book, uh, the Nick Hornby book, Fever Pitch. A Fever Pitch, I forget exactly what the... I didn't read the book. I saw the movie in which they swapped out soccer for baseball. But the story is about a... Uh, a guy that's this ultra fan uh, in the movie was a baseball team. It, it, he's this ultra fan of, I believe it was the Boston Red Sox in the movie. And he is, he's drawn to the sport, not because he's ever played it, but because watching the sport was the only thing he ever did with his father that, that bounded. And I think he came from a divorced family. Uh, so, so now he's participating in, in not ever playing baseball, but participating in this simulacrum of, of the sport. He, he's watching <laughs> he's watching the sport to relive a previous instance of watching the sport. And, and the entire idea is that it's a ceremony of caring about who wins the game. My father really cared about who won the game. Therefore, if I really care about who wins the game, then I will, uh, I will be sort of communing with my ancestors. It's the same instinct, but the instinct is now man magnified. It's now redirected onto a simulacrum. And in the book and the movie, the character says, well, I never want to meet the players. I never want to meet the players because I'm afraid that if I meet the players, then I'll learn that they don't care as much about winning or the legacy of the team or the spiritual quality of the team as I do. And then the illusion of the entire game will disappear for me. But it is an illusion. These teams are corporate entertainment products and they're, they're bought by uh, essentially companies that have no connection to the town. These people are mercenaries. They're free agents. These football clubs, these baseball organizations, they hire people to play money ball with them as if the players were stocks. They play the numbers. They do calculations and advertisements like we're any kind of movie franchise. Is there a belief in winning? I guess that still is true in a sense. I guess we still believe in winning. I don't know. I mean, it, it. but what does that actually mean, though? What does it ultimately symbolize? It doesn't symbolize anything that you do or any bonds you have with other men, uh, other than sort of a simulacrum of one that you have with your father. It's completely empty. It's a completely hollow god waiting to be toppled over. All that's needed is for the baseball players to start deciding who wins the games in advance, the way they do in, in professional wrestling. For, for the final illusion, for the final uh, fakeness of the sport to be real. And it'd probably be better if they did that anyway. It would probably be better for the eventual purposes of the people who manage it. Uh, you know, this is... Um, it's depressing because it's a hollow gone. And everything is like this through the movies. Movies. 
Man, it's been ages since I've seen a movie that I've really liked in the theater. I mean, again, I saw some horror movies that I really liked. The Ari Aster existentialist movie, Bo is Afraid, that's a damn good movie. It's not, I mean, it's, you could argue it had a certain ethnic flavor to it. I happen to like that ethnic flavor, uh, for the record. But it is it is a Kafka esque master, masterpiece in the spirit that Kafka, uh, and, and it's very very suited for our times too, because it one hundred percent captures a large amount of the feeling that we have living in the twenty first century. But the whole point of the movies was that they had some kind of communion with the spirit of the age, and with the exception of these horror movies that we view now like the Ari Aster movies that literally talk about the decline and, and the looming apocalypse that we all feel moving in the background. Every other movie I've seen has just been a complete fantasy reality. And not only a fantasy reality, I mean, all movies are fantasies, but the, the spirit of the movie itself does not even describe anything real. The Mario movie, my kid loved it. It was a fun time at the movies because he loved it so much that I couldn't help but liking it. That movie was a terrible movie. In all levels, it was a terrible movie. It was a terrible movie because there was no substance to it whatsoever. Uh, I mean, it, it was basically just a bunch of callbacks to the video game, which is fine if you're three years old, I guess. Or it's fine if you're a nostalgist. Okay, fine. Mario lives in Brooklyn, and he's an Italian, and he lives in a big Italian family. Does that sound anything remotely like what it means to live in Brooklyn this day and age? Yeah, that's what that's a common experience, and this might be what it meant to live in Brooklyn in the seventies and the eighties, when when the when these characters were based, where, where people remember what Brooklyn used to be like. You know, okay, blue collar Brooklyn workers who who go home to a big Italian family and they're all eating spaghetti around the table. Like that's the classic Brooklyn stereotype that the character of Mario is obviously based on. That's not any kind of existent spirit in the modern age. The existent spirit is the video game itself, which we remember as a copy of previous video games that come from the 1980s. So it's a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy that's packaged for nostalgia and that's 100% hollow and waiting to topple over. And we all have to kind of go through this, participating in the illusion that the connection to these things in real life is still strong. When they're dead, It's the same thing is true for, for what Juniper Tree was saying about, about a variety of things like wasp culture. And she had a number of tweets. I think she's I think she's a mother of a large family, also an artist. And uh, she sort of lamented the fact that although she was raised in a wasp culture, wasp culture is kind of dead. And she's pointed out several times that the uh, that women's role as homemakers is really very limited because previously the whole idea of being a homemaker was that while you are creating this uh, while you're creating a family, you were also building up a larger community and she points this out in the form of like there are intelligent women who are mothers who are homemakers. What are they doing with their talents? Well, previously, they were building up a thick cultural community. They were staffing the churches. And everyone believed in the religion of the churches. And the churches addressed the actual spiritual crises of the age. And there was a feeling that this existence, this cultural space, had a future. When you celebrated the holidays, you were carrying on a tradition that your children would practice also, and their children's children after them, and so on and so forth. But in the present day, culture itself feels like it's dead because no one believes that it will carry forward. There's no expectation that it will carry forward. The boomers who are currently holding on to the cultural apertures themselves handle this gift like it's their inheritance that will be buried with them like an Egyptian. Like they're going to take Western culture, mummify it, and have it entombed with them in their burial. And then after them, the sands of the ages will sweep forward and consume what remains so that it, there'll be no other generation that ever experiences it. I say this going through many churches that are superficially healthy. 
are superficially healthy, except for the fact that they are not addressing their current spirit of the age. And as such, they are becoming just artifacts of a boomer sentimental sentimentality that has no place in the modern world. Women can participate in this, but they're not building anything larger that's artistic, that's deep. And so you have what Juniper Tree pointed out as a problem. Women have a deep need to contribute in a way that fulfills all of their talents, that embraces all of their artistic desires. Yet all of the typical avenues that they want to walk into are dead. In the same way that all the typical avenues that men want to walk into are dead as well. I think that there is a way to revive this in the microcosm, but I don't exactly know how to revive it when the baby boomers are still alive. And I know that sounds incredibly morbid to say, oh, I don't, I, oh, well, I can't wait till the baby boomers are dead, right? And then we'll, then we'll know what winds blow. Then we'll, then we'll know what we actually have, right? The problem is, is that the old world is so large and sh so huge and so primary in our own minds that we can't say that the small green shoots growing up beneath our feet because the ghost of the old world is just so overpowering. No one wants to push that idol over, even though it's hollow and dead, because they know that the second that that idol falls, the dark gods will return and true horror will be visited on the earth. But it's only in that process that we can actually see what's right in front of our eyes, what we actually have. We're walking through a demon haunted world at this stage. We can see it. Nobody else can. People are slowly being able to see these things happening before their eyes. And this kind of leads me to the last Morgoth, Morgoth essay of the night, which is, his essay on on, on, Nyarth, uh, on H. P. Lovecraft's book Nyarth Latef. Now, I, I, of all the essays that I should say, there's a handful of essays that Morgoth's written that I've always really envied, and this is one of them because the Dream Cycle of H. P. Lovecraft was in many ways his masterpiece. It was a series of of books that were written about dreams, and, and the primary, the the great thing about these stories is they make absolutely no sense as a ca canon people try to go back and they try to resurrect the the exact placement of the gods in a hierarchy these are about these otherworldly gods that communicate to morals and dreams and, and if you play any of the board games that i like you'll, you'll know that they have their individual identities and their qualities and, and you know because you're you're literally running a game system with them in it this is not the point the point is the imagistics that they imply and the feeling that they bring to you, and the feeling that they awaken in all of us. And, and one said, so, you know, H.B. Lovecraft himself called this Yog Satha three because he felt that you know, the, the consistency was really irrelevant. The, the point was, is the emotion they inspire. And they, each of them has a consistent emotion that they kind of bring forward. And, and the one that I remember the most is, is, well, there are several that I remember quite prominently, but the one that's most relevant for our age is the god Nyarthlotep. And Nyarthlotep is this figure that appears in the margins of most H.P. Lovecraft stories as kind of this herald of bad things to come. He, he's this being that is not really a spook in the proper sense, but as he comes, the rest of the apocalypse, he is the harbinger of the darkness, the crawling chaos, as he's called. And everywhere where he's seen, the age is kind of brought to a close. In Stephen King, I believe, in his uh, his large canonical universe, either The Dark Tower and a few other of his stories, he has a, a Nyarlathotep-type character called Randall Flagg, who I don't think H.P. Lovecraft really captures the cosmic significance of this character, but he gets the, he gets the same idea that this is a harbinger. And Morgoth in his essay on, on the first story of, of Nerath Lotep uh, really captures that this is, this is the sense that, that occupies our own age. In the original story about this creature, Nerath Lotep appears in, in this ancient setting 
this Egyptian setting right before it's about to collapse in on itself, right before all hell's about to break loose. And the first paragraph is something that I want to read here. Nyarthlatep, the crawling chaos. I do not recall distinctly when it began, but it was months ago. The general tension was horrible. To a season of political and social upheaval was added a strange and brooding apprehension of hideous physical danger. A danger widespread and all-embracing. Such a danger as may be imagined only in the most terrible phantasms of the night. I recall that the people went about with pale and worried faces and whispered warnings and prophecies which, when, which no one dared consciously repeat or acknowledge to himself that he had heard. A sense of monstrous guilt was upon the land, and out of the abysses between the stars swept the chilling currents that made men shiver in dark and lonely places. There was a demonic altercation in the sequence of seasons. The autumn heat lingered fearsomely, and everyone felt that the world and the universe had passed from the control of known gods or forces of those gods to forces that were unknown. And then it was Narthlatep who came out of Egypt. Those are the first words of the story of Narthlatep, the bringer of the chaos times. The shadow of the dead god. It's something that I'm thinking about. In this fall season, things make more sense. Horror stories make more sense because they actually accurately portray the world we live in. And at least people are acting, or people in those moments where we watch horror movies at least act like we should all be acting. We should all be acting like we're in a horror movie when we walk around the streets today because nothing makes sense, nothing is supposed to make sense. Everyone is aware of the dark prophecies that surround us, but no one wants to speak their name. No one wants to speak their name because they know if they speak the name of the devil, it will appear that that devil will topple over the false gods before them. And then the mercy, they will be at the mercy of forces unknown until they can discover something to actually believe in that is true, that is hopeful, and that has some kind of substance to it that they feel is worthy of existence in a reality that they will never experience. With that, guys, that is the end of the lecture portion of this Fiddler's Green podcast. I'm going to give a com I'm going to go to Super Chats. The link for the entropy is in the description. And I'm going to be going to the commercial break now. I'll see you for Super Chats. Hark. Gentle listener, are the woes of the modern world getting you down? Isolation. Atomization. Alienation. Oh no! But a new approach to the internet and social connections is coming to the fore. A place to meet quality people undaunted by the challenges of modernity. A space for new and better conversations, unfettered by the bounds of wokeness. For those men of quality, Gumption with a can do spirit. Introducing basket weaving. Basket weaving, a new craze sweeping the nation, bringing quality people together. Basket weaving is not an organization or a club, but a practice. Basket weaving takes social media connections and makes them real, forging the trust so long frayed by our decadent clown world. How do you start? Simply join one of our inlet servers. Look for the channel that corresponds to your locality and begin interacting with people who want to work together locally. Regular meetups are occurring now all across America and many non-American countries. So fight the modern poison with your fellow listeners to build new organizations, new friendships, and eventually a brighter future.
Hey guys, welcome back. Um, I'm going to get on to Super Chats right now. Okay. Um, all right, guys. It's, it's late, so I'm going to answer these Super Chats. And before I do, I will remind everyone that I, I do run a Substack, which is the main place that you can find all my materials. The link should be in the description in the low bar. I also release a podcast version of Biddler's Green Podcast that is just the monologue without the Super Chats. So if you want to go hear the monologue, I'm releasing those periodically as, as little audio podcasts that you don't have to actually have the YouTube window there. And you don't have to deal with the super chat period also if you if you don't like it or the, or the intro. Uh, I, I might actually release the archive too eventually if I can figure out how to do that. But just letting you know that that's available to you. Uh, the, the audio podcasts are going to be alternating paid and unpaid. So you can, some of them will be available for free and some of them won't. So if you want all of them, or if you just want to view them when they come out on YouTube before they sunset, then feel free to go ahead and do that and uh, support my project that way. But with that being said, I'm going to get onto the super chats. Hopefully everything is going fine in the chat. I'll check on it very quickly here. Okay. Um, Oh yeah, the basket weaving, uh, you have to DM me for the basket weaving link. Uh, the basket weaving is, uh, I probably should include a temporary link that's, I'm, I'm, we're having a little bit of a hard time with too many people joining right now. So we're we're sending out temporary links so that we can stage the, the onboarding process a lot better. Uh, I will, uh, I'll, I'll try to figure out a way to do this for the live stream when I, coordinate with the people who are running the basket weaving thing. But for now, just DM me on X, Discord, or Telegram, and I'll, I'll pass along, or you can email me. I'm slower at email. There's people who email me who I haven't replied with links yet. So if you use email, it'll be a little bit slower than the other way around. Um, okay, great. So now let's go to the Entropy Super Chats. Ben White for $5 USA. Pretty stream guess is the picture that of Ozymandias, I've always loved the poem. No country remains prosperous forever and most will eventually disappear. It appears that Americans, especially the leftist ones, do not think that applies to them. Uh, yeah, certainly they do not. And it, this is it's very, very obvious that the, the progressives or leftists think that they've broken out of the civilizational cycle. Uh, they've broken out of the cycle of Asabaya, as Ibn Khaldun would put it. The picture in the background is a drawing, uh, a 19th century drawing of a, a shattered statue of, um, oh God, who is the Pharaoh? It, it's the fallen statue of uh, Ramusin. I think that's the Pharaoh's name. This is a, re you can find pictures, photographs of it as well in, in you, know, you can all the, all the 19th century British explorers on the statue too. It's a very famous site in Egypt. This was a new world king, a, a new dynasty king of Egypt. And this real world location is the inspiration for uh, Shelley's Ozymandias poem, which is the, the great, the great, the great, great poem that everyone remembers. If you did not grow up with that poem in high school, then you are in some ways impoverished. Go look it up now. It's by Percy Shelley, one of the great romantic artists. And it starts, I once met a traveler from an antique land who told me, you know, to, I, I, I can't recite the entire poem, but, but it goes like that. Uh, but yes, I mean, and this is the sense you get in Egypt too, is that Egypt lives in the shadows of the old world. They live in the shadows of a ruined empire. And in, in many ways, the shadows of the empire kind of broke them. I, I don't want to say it's fatal for a civilization to do this because if you go back to medieval literature, if you go back to Dante and before Dante, people talk about Italy like it's this graveyard. It's the civilized, it's this, Rome is a heap of ruins. Nothing happens there ever. Nothing happens in the West ever. It's a heap of ruins and remembrance of what once was. There is no coming back from this. But then 300 years later, they're having the Italian Renaissance. Uh, the idea that civilization never returns or that there's never a civilizational spring because there's a civilizational winter is a mythology. 
but but I often see people trying to to jump the gun. I mean, it's just a simple question like I was asking on this stream. I, I, you you don't you don't have any right to take a side in this fight between two other peoples unless you can tell me definitively what people you belong to. And no one has a really good grasp of what that means yet, especially in the new world. In the old world, especially in England, you know, uh, there's this understanding that, okay, I'm English and the English are going to exist after this civilizational winter the same way they existed in it before. The problem with this perspective is that the English are currently a godless people. Which means that they're still on the they're still on the fall side of winter, and, and so we have no idea what the English ethnicity is going to look like when when they discover either a new version of Christianity or a new religion to guide them forward. And so, sure, you know, maybe the Anglo Saxons will appear on the other side of this civilizational collapse looking more or less the same he, as he was on, 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 as he was going into it, which would be historically a little unusual. Most peoples in these kind of civilizational collapses get massively altered. Uh, but, but a lot of this loyalty to, to a core peoplehood is, is very hypothetical because the people themselves don't have an understanding of it that's very, very fully realized. I hate to say this, guys, but after the baby boomers pass away from this scene, all of these questions will become very, very apparent very, very quickly. And short of some technological or biological or natural apocalypse, these will have to be answered and they will completely remake our political environment. Who are we? Of the people who want to actually carry on and have children, who actually care about having a generation to pass on customs to, who are we? And I think that right now people do not have a good answer to that question. And one of the reasons we don't is that we can't organize for it without having intergenerational cooperation. And the generation that has come before us does not want to participate in this in any realistic way. I I, I don't know. I, I was like, oh, this will wake the baby boomers up. This will wake the baby boomers up. I guess one thing, one of the reasons why I am interested in Christian nationalism is that there's just a huge group of, of what we would classically call boomer cons that just can't plausibly remain asleep any longer. They just have to, they just, they just can't, they just can't. And, and, and their, their, their position relative to, to sort of classical ideas of Christian nation building and the proper governance of Christian princes, it's so dissonant and so nonsensical that, that if they ever encounter dialogue again that's at all reasonable, they'll immediately be exposed as frauds. I mean, how are they going to recover from this last week? The anti-Christian nationalism guys like, oh, hey, Jesus said that we need to eschew all nationalist politics unless that nationalism is non-Christian and then it's all good. Like, Christian nationalism, not. Nah. Jewish nationalism is awesome. That's in that's that's instantly discredited. So I, mean, I guess I'll just never have to have dialogue again. I guess their dialogue will have to be forever just a series of TikTok videos. But at some point, people are going to want to have conversations that actually get to the heart of spiritual problems. That start grasping at things that we can actually do. I mean, the stuff is the stuff is there for the taking. I mean, it's not like the power of film because we don't make good films anymore. It's not like the power of film is just gone from our age and, and, the, the, and no one can ever have a spiritual experience watching a film. Like I just rewatched Titus Andronicus. That movie for me has great spiritual significance. The Exorcist, while a much more flawed creation still has spiritual significance. Music still has spiritual significance. And in sports, just the act of playing sports and, and building up bonds in that way, these things are still avenues that are available for us. It's just our modes of life aren't organized around taking those individual holy moments and building them into an apparatus that we could use for our real identity. It's all designed to take those individual spiritual moments and just go, that was a nice experience. 
and there's no more relevance to that that can be connected to anything else in the rest of your life. It was a nice spiritual experience, and now it's gone like tears in the rain, like sand blowing across the dune. The only meaningful experiences that have any relevance outside the moment in which they occurred will be entombed with the baby boomers, like gold with the pharaohs. Bobby Chezek for $10 USA. Just got done running my first marathon. I would highly recommend everyone do a 5K at least once in their lifetime. God bless and keep up the good work. Uh, yes, I highly recommend the 5Ks. If you're in your 20s and you're in a reasonably good shape, 5Ks are easy. I did two of them. Uh, one was the Detroit 5K. That's the one I remember the most because the city was an absolute wreck. And so we're running through Detroit at this 5K with my, you know, with my then girlfriend. <laughs> and, uh, oh my God, it was just like, you're running through these areas and, and thinking, I would probably not want to be in this place at night, but here I am running through it and people are cheering me on with Gatorade. It, it was bizarre. I mean, of course, if you wanted to go and do the marathon, you could run all the way to Windsor across the bridge or whatever. You know, run into another country. But yeah, 5Ks are super good. I can't do them anymore because of my back. I, I have a hard time doing anything that's at all high impact. Although I, I, I've been doing like a lot of elliptical stuff. That, that's very nice. Uh, helping out the back problems. You know, these things like, it's so hard because when your hobbies are sedentary and your job is sedentary, your ability to exercise yourself is, it's hard to make time for it. But I just have to always force myself to do it every single night, except for the nights when I'm streaming. Ben White for $3 USA. Apologies if you spoke regarding the Israel-Hamas war already. <laughs> yeah, that was the majority of the thing. But do you think this will be causing a split in the left? I'm noticing disagreements within my social circles. Um, I, yeah, I should have mentioned this too. Um, I mean, it, it is causing a split in the left, which is one reason why if you're a right winger, it behooves you just to stay out of this conflict. Your interest is to have no dog in the fight, absolutely positively. Because you can only help the left by getting involved in this conflict on one side or the other. You can only help the left. The problem is, is I, I'm, I'm not aware. I mean, it does feel like that this conflict is actually could be meaningful. Because it could separate the radical leftists from their donor base. Their donor base is largely, I mean, it's disproportionately Jewish. It is largely academic. It is largely a boomer. And it is largely pro-Israel, even, even though it kind of whistles past the graveyard when it comes to the broader implications of being pro-Israel, sometimes literally. So this could, this could have a potential to separate the left from their funding base. But the problem is, is at this stage... As we learned from the trans movement, the, the radical left is it seems like it's pretty much autonomous at this stage. Uh, they don't care about internal contradictions. I mean, transgenderism is rife with internal contradictions. They're not worried about contradictions with previous versions of, of leftism. Uh, again, you know, the whole turf phenomenon. It's a thing. The left suffered very little for that whole phenomenon. And, and it's it, they just kind of tank it. And, and they don't; they just don't permit the dialogues. Uh, it'll only hurt them insofar as it separates them from their money. And it might offer up, I mean, it could offer up, so what will happen, the opportunity for the right in, in this division is that the, the, the moderate left, the funders, will start, they'll feel like they're politically homeless. And in the process of being politically homeless, they'll open up a dialogue with the right. The right wing, the hard right wing, needs to be part of that dialogue as much as possible, which is one reason why this rank, gross anti-Semitism does not help us at all. Now, I, I, I think that like it's very good to ask questions. I, I ask questions like, I don't remember the last time. I really don't remember many Jewish leaders supporting Christendom. I'm sorry. That's not something that is a very common thing. <laughs> inside Jewish spaces. And it's important to realize this. But as much as possible, the right wing or the distant right needs to be part of these conversations that are going to open up with the disaffected people who are now moving away from the progressive coalition. 
I, I don't think it's going to shatter the progressive coalition like glass because the progressive coalition is held up by people that have nowhere else to go. They have nowhere else to go because they're involved in things that would be radically socially un unacceptable in any kind of sane society. So any kind of reversion to sane society in any way, shape, or form would, would immediately cause them to move from a reasonably high position in a status hierarchy to occupying the absolute lowest rung. So, you know, I think that what you should be looking for is an opportunity to dialogue with these disaffected leftists. And in this process, people like Yoram Harzoni could be a great asset for this process. But if there's going to be an alliance, you know, or, or, or people offering sympathies to the Jewish cause, it needs to be done with an understanding that there's a mutual acknowledgement that Christians and Christian peoples have a right to a similar acknowledgement. Even if those people do not currently have a nation that represents them, even if they're a diaspora, even if the current governments of these places or the current representatives of these diasporas don't feel that their people is a real people, there still needs to be a mutual acknowledgement that this exists in the abstract. In the same way that I'm sure the Jewish people would believe that they, they existed before the state of Israel existed. So there's that. All right. Thank you very much, Ben White. AS for $10 USA. Should I take the incentives to leave my family in an urban area to teach in rural Australia? I think Aus is Australia. My wife and I are looking to have kids soon, and I'm struggling with the decision of independence versus support. Um... Well, AS, I'm the, I'm the wrong person to ask because I'm literally dealing with this independence versus support thing myself. The problem is, if you're having kids, you need a support network. So, look, if I were you, ideally, if, if I could, presumably you're doing this before you actually have kids, so you've got some flexibility... While you're having kids, you want to be near family. Because if you're not near family and you want to have a relationship to these families, it's going to cost you an arm and a leg if you have a large distance in between you. Furthermore, the lack of support is also going to cost you an arm and a leg. So the way you want to handle it, I mean, ideally, and, and if you move to a rural area that's far away from everyone, you and your wife are going to have a large amount of, of time and money costs that comes from that lack of support network. Ideally, what I would do is I might invest in rural property and then live in an affordable situation, in a very affordable situation while you're raising your family that's closer to your home and then try to stage a move out to the hinterlands after you built the relationships necessary in the new area. I don't know if you have enough money for that, but um, I really don't recommend, in, in, unless you're in your 20s and you're just, you have tons of energy and you're ready to just homestead hardcore, I really don't, I really recommend just don't go moving off into the middle of nowhere and assume that it's all going to work out. Uh, oftentimes people underestimate the cost of not having the support network. So I would say that either try to create a support network where you're going to try to move and have a plan for that or raise your family near your existing support network and then plan a staged move out for when you're kind of in the tail end of your family creation, right? At least according to how you foresee things going. So either, you know, either you're really a pro at doing this and you know what you need and you're immediately plugged into the parenting groups or, you know, you're done having kids and now you can move out because they're all old enough to participate in like hobby farming and it will be a really fun exercise. I would say those are the two ways to approach this problem if I were in your shoes, but I don't have your details. But just never underestimate the cost of being far away from a support network. A lot of millennials underestimate that. Nerve and V Maker for $5 USA. If you want a classic era horror movie, then check out the films of Val Luton, Cat People, Body Snatchers, Island of the Dead. 
These 40 films are richer than anything from the 30s. Also, you must watch The Innocence, 1961. That film is literally perfect. Um, I have watched Body Snatchers. That's good. Have I watched The Innocence? I think I have. Um, I, maybe I skipped over that. But Nerf and Vmaker, thank you for that feedback in terms of movies. We'll definitely put them on my watch on my wife's horror movie watching list. Although usually I use that time to write, so maybe I won't watch them myself. Novum for ten dollars USA. Your talks on nerdy topics suggest to me that you're you've had similar issues as I have had, where you like games and hobbies but could go without the weirdos. If the scene is filled with rigorous generous uh, rigorous degeneracy, I like that combination. If the scene is fig- filled with rigorous degeneracy, do you just quit the hobby and go somewhere else? Or do you keep trying to find new people? Well, no, if I'm, I'm, yeah, I mean, the ultimate example of this is like Warhammer, right? In 2020, I painted an army and I did so because a lot of dads in the area who were all the dads who weren't shit libs, it seemed, had this as a hobby. And so you, know, you could go play with them and they wouldn't be, you know, they wouldn't be red pilled, but they would they'd be moaning about some things that I saw in the world and, you know, there would be a camaraderie there. And the setting of Warhammer was so reactionary. There was that relationship there, right? And they, were, they all had kids and they were, they were all kind of similarly positioned in professional jobs like I was. So it was a, it was a very similar area of camaraderie. And then you move to a different area and it's all like, you know, these weird guys in their 20s and 30s that just are not on a life course that would even necessarily give them families. And you're kind of looking at it. It's just not even the same environment, right? Um, well, I mean, to tell you the truth, Nova, uh, what, what I've done personally is I've just, uh, every, every now and again, my wife go out and and, and, and play, have a, a, a game night at a local hobby shop, we, we, we pitch for a, a babysitter and uh, we have a good time with the people there. Some of them are kind of weirdos, but we kind of overlook it. And, and uh, what I did recently is I've kind of turned these events into basket weaving events and invited people from the local basket weaving server to come join us. Sometimes we get people, sometimes we don't, but it's more or less a mixed bag. But, but really, and I'm going to do a talk on this, really... The game is made by the people who play it. Case in point, Magic the Gathering. Is Magic the Gathering the best dueling card game? Answer, no. There's one that's just better in all regards for my money. Everyone knows I think it's Netrunner. But nobody plays Netrunner. Everyone plays Magic. So if you want to play a dueling card game, you have to play that game. And the same thing is true for Warhammer. I've heard there's better games, but you have to play that game if you want to play with people. If you if you want to play a strategy board game, you're probably going to be playing chess and not Go unless you live in Japan. If you want to play a um, if you want to play a strategy 52 card game, you're probably going to be playing Bridge and not Euchre if you're living outside of Michigan or Ohio. You always play the game that is played by other people, and and to do that, you, you you want to cultivate people who play that game. Really, once we get the basque weaving community a little bit more robust, I will literally play any strategy board game that people want me to play, as long as I can play that strategy board game with other people who also play that game. I don't care if it's Settlers of Catan, and I hate Settlers of Catan. But I'll play Settlers of Catan. That's what the other Basque Weavers want to play. <laughs> so, so there's that. Okay. Um, anyway, thank you very much, Novum. Uh, I, I guess to answer your question, I don't know if I have really answered your question. Um, I, I kind of tolerate the weirdos. But, but you really want to be, ideally, you want to be playing games with your friends not making friends with the games you play. It's easier to do it one way than the other. So I would, um, I have met a few people playing games, but oftentimes the relationships you build through game playing is, are not very thick at all. They're not very thick at all. 
And so you always want to be developing a taste for games based on the people you can play them with. Um, okay, next one. Nerve AMV Maker for $10 USA. Uh, Hereditary really disturbed me. Despite being explicitly about possession, neither God, the church, nor the cross are ever mentioned or shown. The characters don't even think about it as an option. It's as if God abandoned the world to the demons and removed all memory and evidence of his existence from them. Well, yeah, Nerve AMV Maker, which is why all logic in these sort of tableau horror movies of the late 2000s, it's just a world where, where people are just kind of, it feels like they're abandoned to the chaotic spiritual forces. That's why they feel so radically appropriate for our own time, because the only gods that exist in our own age are false gods. The only gods that people actually worship in the public square. So if aliens or demons just manifestly appeared in front of our eyes, like apparently they did a few months ago, and at least with the aliens, uh, no one would even think about trying to have a spiritual reaction. The reaction would simply be to ignore the demons and to hope that they're not preyed upon by those extra spiritual entities, because that's all we know how to do. We're completely spiritually disempowered by our leaders. We're completely sp spiritually disempowered by our age. And so we're just like sheep hoping that we're not preyed upon by, by these more powerful forces that rule over our lives. And, and we'll, we will be in that situation until we discover the luminaries, until we can discover the saints, until we can discover the holy moments that reconnect us with the real spiritual substructure of reality. And then human beings will start to become spiritual entities again, or I should say spiritually active creatures again, and things will again start to make a certain amount of sense. In many ways, this was the triumph of things like the Divine Comedy. The Divine Comedy took the medieval world and, and, and displayed the cosmos in a way that was, 100, that was completely ordered in a totalizing sense politics and religion and poetry were all layered into a superstructure that was the divine comedy and because of that everything the things that are horrific were made sensical the challenges that were hard were given meaning it's the exact sense the exact sense that is so Tasteable in the divine comedy is the exact sense of spiritual thickness that we cannot ourselves in this moment access. And that creates the backdrop for these tableau horror movies like Hereditary. But thank you, Nerve and Maker, for the contribution. Dreadnought for $5 USA. Government, we hate you, your religion, your race, and you will own nothing. You will bow to every disgusting fetish, live in misery and endless war, and then die. But worry about aliens. Me. What are they going to do to us that you aren't already? I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, that's the case, right? I mean, what are they going to, I mean, at this stage, it's very, very hard to believe that there aren't elements in the government that aren't hoping that a large amount of the people in this world just don't kill themselves through one means or the other. So what exactly, I mean, aliens, they would have to be literal demons or demonically inspired aliens for them to be more horrifying in many ways than what our government's currently pursuing. The government is completely insane as far as I can figure. It's senile. It, it acts only to do things in the moment that make virtually no sense in the larger scheme of things. And there's no broader plan. There's no broader vision of what humanity will be in the future. There's no broader aspirations for what humanity will be in the future. Anyway, thank you very much, Dreadnought. And I'm going to go on to the next one. Gray Smog for $5 USA. Did you see Style is Substance, leftist review of your Vosh debate? It was a curious one with a third-party leftist perspective on your Vosh debate. I couldn't make it past five minutes. Uh, yeah, I actually talked to this guy who made that video. He was uh, from 2020. So I did a debate with Vosh, and I... 
you know, I didn't understand what I was getting myself into. I thought it was just going to have a conversation with a reasonable person. And say that said I got the debate bro treatment from this complete ass hat. And so after the third or fourth time, he contradicted himself. I just rage quit. And uh, the thing is, is that I engaged with the guy who made that sub- style of substance video. And he was this completely deracinated Zoomer who, uh, I mean, he criticized Vosh for not having any substance. But but he didn't have any desire to engage on the subject of belief itself. He he just, um, he was just there. It seemed like he was just there for the spectacle. It seemed like he was just, oh, wow, you know, I don't, he, he, I don't care about the future. I don't care about, uh, I don't know, like, but leftism is the right opinions. Therefore, they're the ones that I embrace because they're the ones that all the studies show are correct. And now I have the right opinions. And when I actually engage him on what do you believe, what do you value, there is this, I mean, this is back in 2021, so he might have changed. For all I know, this guy is a Chad right now. But when I when I talked to him via DMs back in the day, or at least someone who was posing as this guy, ah, oh man, I got this sense of someone who's just completely disconnected from the reason why I do politics. I do politics to meet other fellow believers and to build relationships with them and to talk about things that are genuinely troubling me right now. And what's genuinely troubling me right now, as I've talked about, for better or worse, is I feel that I'm walking through a demon-haunted world and that nobody really can recognize this reality yet. And we have to act like there's this pretense uh, of this American order that's obviously disintegrating in front of our eyes. Every single instance, every single occurrence that happens in, in the modern world is screaming at the top of its lungs, you live in a universe that has real political consequences. Yet everyone just wants to act like this is another social media meme. Another thing that they can embrace as a consumer product, and it's pissing me off, not not just because it's dark, because I have to constantly go through the pantomime that everything is all right, that everything is just going on like it always will. We'll be in the eternal 90s, or we're going to be moving on to a world that's even better than the 90s, and I can't exist in this mode anymore. Anyway, thank you very much. Asteroid Assassin for $3 USA. Why do Christians celebrate Halloween? I get Christmas as a Muslim. I feel like I I feel it. I like it even though I don't partake in it. But why Halloween? I don't know. It has a bad vibe. Decorations scared me as a kid. Um, So Asteroid Assassin. So Halloween is part of a pair of holidays in the Catholic calendar called All Souls, All Saints Day and All Souls Day. Now, All Saints Day is the real holiday. It celebrates basically all saints together. So saints are everybody in the Christian point of view that are saved and that are currently in heaven, I believe. I don't believe it counts. If you believe in purgatory as a Christian, I don't think that saints count for people who are in purgatory. Or even if that's an actual temporal state and not just something that's fulfilled immediately by by our reckoning of time or how we would superimpose our concept of time onto the afterlife. But after All Saints Day, there's time set aside for celebrating all souls who are not necessarily saints. And classically in, in the Christian tradition, in, in various Catholic traditions, although Halloween itself was a a later addition uh this was this was a it's like mardi gras like mardi gras isn't actually a holiday <clears throat> mardi gras is the day before fasting begins on ash wednesday and so what everyone would do in mardi gras is they'd eat and they'd have a big party because you couldn't have big feasts and parties during the the the, the month of, or the the 40 days of fasting during lent and so, um, so great. So, so Mardi Gras is like an implicit holiday on the Christian calendar, even though the Catholic Church discouraged it. So what All Souls Day is meant to celebrate is just sort of a remembrance for the 
the people who have passed away generally, even though we don't necessarily know whether they're saved or not. We, we pray for the repose of those souls. Colloquially, and in the folk sense, this became a way of celebrating pagan ancestors who had died explicitly outside of belief in Christ. So in Dante's conception, the people who are condemned to limbo, and in some Protestant conceptions, souls that are condemned to hell, who may at the end of the world be saved by Christ's intercession, we do not know. But you can see how this slowly evolved in secularized term to become a celebration of spooks and a celebration of the dead. This is, this is where the Mexican Day of the Dead comes from. This is, this is where uh, the celebration of the pagan ancestors comes from. So, so it, Halloween is kind of like this secularized version of a Catholic holiday that was paganized. It was a repose for the dead in the Christian calendar that became, you know, a, a celebration of the dead and also kind of a celebration of our pagan ancestors to become a celebration of all the spooks and, and, the, and, and the things that, that, that frighten us in the afterlife. And, and that's what now has become our secularized holiday of Halloween. And I, I don't know, I think it's an appropriate time to remember our pagan ancestors and to celebrate them and to pray for the repose of their souls and the potential, and the potential of their salvation upon the second coming of Christ, although we know not whether that is possible or not. I believe that we still should pray for them, regardless of, of the state of their souls. Grace Mog for $5. Why have all the recent Pixar movies, Elemental, Lightyear, Soul, Onward, been such massive flops? Um, well, I mean, it's a generational thing. I mean, first of all, I mean, you'll notice this in a lot of the early Pixar movies have kind of reactionary themes in them. The two examples, the two best Pixar movies are The Incredibles and Wall-E, both of which are highly reactionary movies. Wall-E is a larger critique about how consumerism and hedonistic pleasure destroys the human will to survive. And that's what it's about, <laughs> right? So, I mean, it, it's, it, it has a reactionary dimension to it. And, and The Incredibles is even more on the nose. And the Incredibles is literally, it's almost kind of like Ayn Randy a little bit. Like, it's like, oh, the, the superheroes, people who are actually talented, are, are being suppressed by, by sort of mediocre managers because society can't handle extraordinary people or Promethean individuals. And you'll notice this in all sorts of things. For instance, Ratatouille has it. Ratatouille really only works as a celebration of her tradition. And the story about the rats is, and you know, Ratatouille is a lesser Pixar movie because it's it's the it's 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 sewn together two movies that are not fully realized. The first one is about the celebration of food and the tradition of French food and its legacy. And the legacy and the defense of that legacy. And then the other much weaker story is the story about like a rat making it up with his family and he wants to be human and they don't want him to be, which is a much weaker storyline, right? And so two weak stories kind of make a weak movie. Or Up, for instance, what is that story? That story is about a promise made by a husband to his wife when they lived their entire marriage as a series of tragedies. They never lived up to their potential. And now he wants to do one last great thing for her to honor her memory. And then, you know, in the middle of that, you have sort of a, 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 a boy looking for a father figure to look up to, which is, I don't know, was that reactionary? It wasn't reactionary in 2011 when that movie came out. Is it reactionary now? I think it was 2010, actually. Is it reactionary now? I don't know. Uh, it's uh, It feels reactionary now to imply even that young men need to have male role models to look up to and and, and to be heroes for them. And, and of course, in the middle of that, they give the, 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 the um, sort of a, a sideways shot on Charles Lindbergh, who's the obviously, obviously the model for their villain, uh, you know, who is, in my mind, an American hero. He's, he has, we have to hate him, though, because... 
he he did he did not want us to enter in on uh in, into World War II. Uh, which I am I I don't really uh, see how he didn't have a point. But um, even though even though I see you know I you could argue either way. Now obviously Hitler declared war on America, so it really wasn't up to us in a technical sense whether we got involved in that war or not. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, the new movies, Elemental, Lightyear, Soul. Uh, it's obviously what ha- it's obvious what happened. Uh, a new generation of filmmakers came in. These people are super political. They don't understand the world they live in. They don't understand real spiritual struggles. So what you have is you have sort of superficial ideas superimposed on onto these Pixar movies and they don't make any sense. So, I mean, here's a good example. Ele- I didn't see Elemental, but I know broadly what it's about. It's about an immigrant family. And uh, the, the thing is, is that they don't take the, the question seriously, right? That they know that there's a conflict between immigrants wanting to carry on their, on their tradition and then them also, and then their children wanting to integrate into the broader, deracinated, homogenous, hedonistic culture. They knew that, that that's a conflict. And they know that the answer to that is, well, kids just need to be themselves and integrate into the new world, even though this destroys their traditions. Uh, the problem is, is that that's kind of a stupid answer. It's a stupid answer because the culture that these kids are integrating into this broadly deracinated American culture is itself dying and hollow and spiritually empty. So by embracing this integrationist mindset, they're trading away the thick and meaningful culture for effectively nothing. In the baby boomer generation, in Generation X, there was actually an exchange here. They were actually getting a culture that was more or less alive and that felt like it had something to say. But now they're trading away their real gods for hollow gods. And the creators who make things like Elemental know that this is a false dilemma, that this is something that's in some sense a lie, but they know that they know that that conclusion is the only one they can come to, and so that the entire premise of the movie is at its heart a lie. And that spiritual lie just seeps through all other elements of the film, so that there can be no catharsis, there can be no decision. A great early example of this is a movie called The Wedding Banquet. I can't remember who, was it Ang Lee who developed, I almost said maybe it's Wong Kar Wai. It's one of these Hong Kong film directors from the 1990s about a Chinese-American guy. And he's gay in San Francisco, or maybe maybe it's New York. I can't remember. I'll just say San Francisco because that's how I remember the movie. And so this, uh, this, uh, his Parents are pressuring him to marry. And this gay Asian guy says, like, okay, look, what I'm going to do is I'm going to marry this starving artist who, who needs to have rent in my apartment complex. And I'm going to, con- and she's also Chinese too. And I'm going to convince my parents that this is, uh, that, that I'm married to her, they'll get off my case and I can go live my gay life, right? And, um... And uh, then, as uh, as a consequence, you know, uh, well, it obviously backfires because what happens is his, his parents show up and as opposed to just having like a pretend wedding in front of a judge, they force him to have like this huge Chinese banquet with all of the meals and, and all of the ceremony around Taoism and all the Chinese customs because he's a big shot in the Taiwanese military apparatus. He was like a lieutenant of of a Shanghai Shek or whatever. And all the Chinese Americans who live in San Francisco really think he's a big deal. So they throw this huge banquet for him. And then somewhere along the line in the bedding ceremony with this woman, the guy accidentally gets her knocked up. And so now uh, the guy not only has to deal with this fact that that he he, he, he had this completely fraudulent wedding to this woman he has no interest in actually being a husband to now they have this illegitimate child and of course the artist woman wants to abort it and so he comes out to his mother as gay and the mother now realizes like oh my god 
all I ever wanted from you was a grandchild. And now you're married and you have a grandchild. And I sacrificed my entire life to give you the education and, and the ticket to America and everything you needed to become a success here. And now that you've done all this and I've thrown you this entire banquet, you're going to abort my grandchild. You're going to kill my child. And she, the, the, the entire drama of the winning banquet revolves around this scene where this Chinese mother is pleading with her fake daughter-in-law not to abort her one chance for a legacy, which she spent her entire life sacrificing for. And the response of this daughter is just, fuck you, I want to live my own life. And that's heartbreaking. Now, of course, this is Hollywood. And so the woman decides not to go through with the abortion. And so there's this kind of phony reconciliation where you go, oh, wow, guess what? This daughter gets to live her own life and this child gets to be adopted by their new gay parents in San Francisco, which is, of course, completely fake, uh, completely gay. <laughs> and those things are not entirely disconnected in my mind. But it, and it sidesteps the main generational drama. But the difficulty is Pixar can no longer describe real spiritual problems as they exist in the main world. And millennials, if they're hired in these positions, don't know how to describe them. All they knew, know how to do is to describe fake spiritual problems they, that they've been taught are the ones people want to hear about. That they've been taught are the ones that play well on social media. These are not the actual spiritual crises that we're experiencing right now. These are just fake outgrowths of what is being incentivized by Hollywood and our social media system. So, so that's why Pixar can't make uh, good movies anymore. Thank you very much, Grace Mogg. I'm um, going to have to accelerate these things again because I'm at the midnight mark. Asteroid Assassin. I listened to John Lennon and now I understand. Why can't we just get along? Here I am with my Jewish girlfriend and our polycule and I'm getting my vasectomy next week. I will finally get laid. <laughs> there you go, Asteroid Assassin. You crack the code. If your aspiration is to get a sterile relationship with a person in a polycule, modernity can hook you up. I don't know what this ultimately means to be part of a polycule because these things are notoriously short-lived and they notoriously don't generate posterity and they notoriously are, are prey to all sorts of egotistical drama. But uh, that's what reality has to offer us in this present day. Ben White for five dollars USA. Dave, I don't know, I don't know. You have the patience to deal with left casts and left prots. Uh, I'm convinced that they're the John Green types who want religion, but they also want to be socially acceptable in a comfortable center left position. I mean, that's yeah, that's obvious. I mean, the evangelicals and the the leftist Catholics are addicted to the 1990s when it was acceptable and good to be Christian. And they'll do anything to get back to that position. But there is no getting back to that position. And they need to get this through their heads. And if they sacrifice the witness of their church so that they can be liked by progressives, that is going to be the end of their particular churches. And everyone can see this except them. And I don't know how to make them see this. Well, I mean, I, I think people are seeing this more and more. And this is why I think these conversations on Christian nationalism are useful, even though I'm highly critical of Christian nationalism itself. Uh, Grace Mogg for $7 USA. I think, you can, see, you, I think you should consider streaming Riff Wizard. It's a retro-style turn-based grid game. It really suits your boomer game tastes. Well, I mean, boomer, I think you mean like Gen X game tastes or older millennial game tastes because boomer game tastes are like Pong and Mario. They're not sophisticated turn-based strategy games. Sophisticated turn-based strategy games were a, a thing that was reached the height of its popularity in the mid-90s as far as I'm concerned. So you're really talking about Gen X taste in video games probably. But yeah, maybe yeah, I could try streaming it. I don't think people would really like game streams. We, we discussed doing this a few times with my wife. We wanted to stream a Magic the Gathering arena game on this channel. I don't think it would be work very well. People don't tune in here to, to, to watch me 
kind of talk about politics where most of my attention is focused on some other elements of the game. Like I said, that's one of the reasons why I have the camera on, so I say 100% focused on what I'm talking about. But, but it is what it is. Gray Smog for $5 USA. What do you consider the fall to be? Is it a literal event? Is it metaphorical? That's a good question. So I taught Genesis in Sunday school recently. And I, I didn't really, I mean, there's some Catholics who really emphasize that the earth is, you know, 6,000 years old or something like that. I, I do not like to teach this. I'm like, I, we don't exactly know what happened in prehistory. I'll say that. But, but I'm open to the possibility that geological time is correct and the earth is billions of years old. And when we talk about the fall, we are talking about, I would say we're talking about a literal event. God had relationships with a family of humans at some point and a deviation from the ultimate plan God had for creation was accomplished. And that this is, in a sense, the cause of all of the evil that we see in the world. No, I mean, there's a lot of crackpot theories that I have personally come up with, I've heard in the past, of how you reconcile pain and evil existing in a pre-fall state. You know, there's there's things you could do with causality, there, there are things you could do with time to reconcile this. But really, look, Grace Small, here's my problem, is that I don't really believe that our understanding of Christianity should be held hostage to the finer points of the first three chapters of Genesis. I, I don't think that, I, I really think that this is a red herring. The, the greater spiritualities that Christianity talks about and that we can observe in actual history are manifestly true and are happening. And there are real historical events like the resurrection that do have evidence for them that have happened. And so whether we can discern the exact timeline of what happened in prehistory is really to me less important than the fundamental communication of spiritual values that's trying to be conveyed by Genesis, which is that human beings had a relationship with the divine power that created this universe and that ordered it properly. And that through a decision of theirs, they disordered their relationship that humanity had with the rest of the world while preserving some element of the fact that they are made in the image of God. And that's the important message of Genesis. Oh, pardon me. And I feel oftentimes quibbling over this stuff really, really, really detracts from what we should be focusing on. Ben White for $5 USA. I watched your video on that guy from El Chapo Trap House. On one hand, I'm disgusted by the hatred he shows towards people like me. On the other hand, his ilk is obviously ill, or he and his ilk are obviously ill. And the third world nationalists will discard people like him the minute white leftists outlive their use. How are us neo-reactionary tradcasts supposed, supposed to handle his viewpoint and people like him? I don't see us using Socratic dialogue to solve this problem. Well, I'm, I, I'm sorry, but like I think we need to treat him and his people with a certain amount of pity. I think p time needs to educate people like this, that their cause is ultimately bullshit. And time will teach these people that their cause is ultimately bullshit. We should correct them when they're wrong. We should engage them aggressively in dialogue. But, but we still need to offer compassion to them to, to show, on one hand, that there is a way back from where they are right now. Because although there might not be a way back for Matt Cressman, especially if he's on death's door, like it sounds like he is, uh, there is certainly a path back for many people who used to be his fans. And there are sincere religious believers. And that's so valuable. I can't tell you how many times I've looked at leftists and thought, you would be an integral part of a healthy artistic system if society was just ordered a little bit better. You would be the perfect person to teach art. To, to mold, If you had the right values, you would be the perfect person to come up with a brilliant mural of the Virgin Mary in a properly ordered system. But instead you're doing like 
furry porn in, in, in a trans discord server or some shit like that. But I just look at these people when I see what they could have been with just a slightly more ordered political reality with slightly better education. These are the sheep that we're meant to guide and we have to educate them sternly. At this stage of reality, at this stage of how, of how things are going to go, we need to be trying to get these people into dialogue with us. If they acknowledge that we're human and we have the same concerns as they do, and we're not evil people, just us sitting next to them, it will be obvious that we're grappling with reality, with political reality as it actually is, and they're grappling with an illusion. It will be obvious that that is the case. But but thank you very much, Ben White. As a matter of fact, I think we need to be dealing more hostily with, with, with sort of the boomer cons at this stage. I think boomers need to get kind of a little bit more of the rhetorical stick and lefty shit libs, lefty progressives need to get a little bit more of a carrot at this stage. There's a lot of very, very wounded people that could be healed by a more properly ordered spirituality that are currently on the left. And there's a lot of, of boomer neocons like Ben Shapiro that just need to be hit up the head and be like, what the fuck are you talking about? What, what the fuck are you talking about, Ben? Uh, do you think you're the only people on this entire earth that ever wanted to have their own homeland, that ever wanted to look back at their ancestors and feel proud about them? And, and if you are not the only people who have ever felt that, then, then where is the representation for, for, for my people in a real political way? And how is that negotiated in these crises that are erupting in the Middle East? Who speaks to those interests? Who educates a new generation of young men to pursue those interests? I, that question needs to be brought to the neocons, to the boomer cons, forcefully. Do they know that when they walk, do, do the anti-Christian nationalists know that when they walk away from Christian politics in America, but embrace Jewish politics for Israel, what they're essentially communicating to their grandchildren is fuck you, we care about some foreign nation's future more than we care about your own. Or they're literally telling their grandchildren that they believe another religion is more accurate and more meaningful to this present world than their own. It's one or the other when they have this position. And they need to be made for, to answer for this. No more tactical Quakerism. Uh, no more tactical pacifism from this group where, the, where they're all give unto Caesars. We can't possibly touch political power, but then they vote for Ed McMuffin or Mitt Romney when it comes to pulling the lever. They either forswear the world in its totality or they embrace the responsibility to look after their posterity and give their posterity a future both spiritually culturally and politically with everything that implies in a responsible Christian way. Does that mean they have to endorse Stephen Wolf's specific program of Christian nationalism? Of course not. But it does mean coming to terms with something approaching rational Christian approaches to politics that have been practiced in almost all other points of history. All right. Thank you so much, Ben White. I'm going to move on to the next one. Asteroidal Assassin for $3 USA. If the attack was intended as a meme, <clears throat> I meant that euphemistically, and how Hamas <clears throat> and how Hamas should have attacked, I guess I should clarify. I'm half African American and half Iranian. You're half Arrest you're half African and half Iran uh Iranian? <laughs> okay, wow. Um well, uh, you are a and you are a uh, both an African and and an Aryan, so that is a complicated position to be in. Asteroidal assassin. I, I thought you were Arab, to be quite honest. If the attack was intended as a meme, when and how have should have Hamas attacked? Well, I, I don't actually know what to say. Asteroidal assassin. I mean, who knows? I mean, the whole point was to create chaos as far as I can figure out and so I mean when you're creating chaos there's no tactics to chaos I mean 
unless you're literally like a chaos space marine, right? They, the idea is, is they wanted to destabilize the Western political order and humiliate it. And they did just that. I, I don't think they could have done a better job at humiliating the modern Western political order. I don't even know what the proper response is for Israel. The proper response for Israel is to push war. I mean, and the, 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 I mean, everyone knows what the optimal move for Israel in this game is. The optimal move for Israel in this game is to have every single one of the Palestinian refugees that are in Gaza move to Europe or move to some other country. The, the, the problem with this is that, is that the easiest way to accomplish this is essentially a rely on European and American leaders betraying their own duty to their Christian populations. Because if they start the resettlement of the Middle East uh, with, the, with the assumption that they can just resettle any Middle Eastern troubled population inside Europe or America, they will essentially be setting up their own Christian populations for increased terrorism, for increased abuse, for increased humiliation within their own institutions. And that, that this shows you that Hamza Yusuf guy from Scotland, that the, the prime minister, he stands up and he says, I mean, it's, it's not even the terrorism. It's not even the gang rapes. It's not even the increased crime. It's just the constant humiliation. He stands up inside Scottish Parliament and tells the Scottish people that there's too many Scots in Scotland and that there need to be a lot, le a lot fewer of them. And so, and that's the real problem with resettling these people. It's the fact that through the education system and through the apparatus of government, your people are going to be systematically culturally humiliated. And from that systematic cultural humiliation, you will generate a new generation of people who do not feel like they have a right to exist, who will not fight for their place in their own homelands, who will have no children, who will carry on no religion, who will build no temples and great monuments, and who will only exist for their own hedonic pleasure, and to avoid further humiliation at the hands of foreigners who do believe they have the right to be there. That's the real danger. And if, Christ, if European and Christian leaders agree to settling any Arabs in their country as a result of a Middle Eastern conflict, they are committing themselves to the humiliation and degradation of their own people for a very minimal amount of relief to Israel itself. Since we all know there will never be an end to the number of Arabs who have a problem with Israel. Sam153 for $15 USA. Another great stream, Dave. Always look forward to them. Cheers. Yeah, this one was kind of a weird one. I didn't really have a good thesis statement, and I was kind of speaking off the cuff on a lot of them. Hopefully, I'll kind of uh, stabilize it for next week, but it's been a very, very hectic week. So thank you, Sam153. Sarah for USA $3. Did you hear Britney Spears revealed Justin Coherster into an abortion? Another example, like casual sex, where feminists refuse to acknowledge that men benefit from modern casual sexual norms. She continues. Um, feminists desperately want women to benefit, but only... Uh, okay, feminists desperately want women only to benefit, but that's not reality. Takes us back to the contra counterpoints debate, or contrapoints debate, where they can't really answer what's wrong with pickup artists and what they're doing. Uh, well, yeah, thank you very much, Sarah. This is the the problem with the abortion debate, right? I mean, this is always the thing. Like, it's all based on stories. It's all based on stories. Like, I remember this. If you lived in California in progressive communities, you'll, you'll know this. Well, we can't have parental notification laws for abortion. Because what if the girl is aborting a, a product of rape or incest. Then when she's notified, she'll be abused when she comes home. Well, I mean, that's a great little story. Has it ever happened? In the overwhelming number of cases where there's rape or incest inside the family, the person doing that rape and incest is pushing for the abortion because the abortion is literally the thing that's covering up the fact that this is going on from both the school other interested family members, like other parents who might not know what's going on, and from the 
the authorities itself, because a 13-year-old girl getting raped by her stepfather is easy to cover up. A pregnant 13-year-old is much harder, because people tend to ask who is the father. So in effect, in, in effect like this story of abuse was much more likely to benefit from abortion. The, the abuser was more much more likely to benefit from the abortion than they were to be, uh, you know, um, dissuaded by the abortion, or or uh, or the victim was much likely less likely to be helped by the abortion. Uh, but this is um, this is something that uh, never got integrated into the conversation. Because the the media was controlled by the left or by people who are sympathetic to abortion, the, o- the the circumstances was always pitched as this is a woman's last resort. This is a tool used by the woman. When overwhelmingly in these circumstances, men and irresponsible men exert pressure for abortion. And the woman is the ultimate victim. That being said, we, we can't fix the abortion culture in this country. And I said this before Roe v. Wade went down. We, we can't, the problem with abortion is the fact that the sexual revolution is the default cultural mode that we all behave in. While the sexual revolution is the default cultural expectation, abortion will be legal in one form or the other by popular demand, unless you have a king that prohibits it. Because it will be made necessary by the fact that society is not going to tolerate women being the only person responsible for whether young children are brought into this world. There needs to be a re-examination of how we handle sex to begin with before we can start addressing abortion. But thank you very much, Sarah. I appreciate the donation. Pale Nimbus for $10 USA. Great stream as always, Dave. Land acknowledgement people like the daughter of a drug dealer who turns up in her Ferrari bought to her brought to her, bought by her dad's drug money, but then declares she recognizes the evil of drugs. I always tell them, then stop enjoying stolen property and leave. There are a dime a dozen in Australia. I mean, yeah, wasn't there just a referendum on, I, I didn't, I know that Franklin did a stream on this, but I have been really behind in watching the Franklin streams, so I didn't quite get around to it. But wasn't, wasn't there a recent plebiscite in Australia on the subject of Aboriginal rights or something to that effect. I seem to remember that. I, it's, just, it's just the fakest shit ever. I can't stand it. If you're going up and giving a prayer to land back, I don't want to concern troll you, but how about you land back your publicly funded auditory into the actual tribe? Maybe we could have the monarchy of tribes. This sounds like an awesome idea. Let's break up the United States and give all the tribes back contiguous areas. And they can rule them like sovereign nations. Absolutely sovereign nations. Do whatever you want. Make whatever laws you want. That will never happen because this is a completely performative fake religion. And everybody knows it's a fake religion. It's women that only hyster- It's a religion that only hysterical women can believe. But that's the whole problem, that our current government is threatened by any religion that could be believed by anybody who is not a hysterical woman. And if your religion happens to be more based, like Islam or real Christianity or real Judaism, they'll try to suppress it. They'll try to essentially, in the words of Aaron McIntyre, turn it into a skin suit and walk around in it. Because the system is threatened by any real religion by which we could come to terms with the real political spirits that that rule our age and have ruled all all ages before ours. It's almost like what Nietzsche said, that every church is the grave of a dead god that it does not want to acknowledge. I don't really believe that because when these churches were built and when people believed in them, the gods that they built them to were very much alive. And they inspired many heroic acts, the number of which we cannot possibly begin to enumerate. The number of great acts inspired by Our Lady in the form of the Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris is innumerable. Innumerable songs, folk tales, novels were birthed in the shadow of that cathedral. But there is a sense in which Nietzsche is right, which 
is that false religion at this late stage in civilization exists to subvert the living religions that came before them because they do not want those living religions to exist under any circumstances because those religions would shatter the hollow idols that they have in front of them right now. And the shatter, the hollow idols are the only thing standing between them and the crawling chaos that will emerge and fill the gaps. And that will lead to something new. I'm starting to sound like an accelerationist, Pale Nimbus, but uh, thank you for your super chat. Dreadnought for $10 USA. I really listened to your SBF FTX stream today. Since then, I really looked into crypto. It struck me that crypto scene is the financial apotheosis of our culture. Inventing value out of nothing, turning bytes that are nothing into value, scamming ordinary people. Fakeness is a financial instrument. Well, that's absolutely true. I mean, that was Sam Bankman-Fried's entire thing. And he said this. He said this in many interviews. He's like, well, we, we found a way to make real money off of pure hype, off of pure speculation. You take a cryptocurrency and you base the cryptocurrency's value in an exchange that's used exclusively for exchanging this cryptocurrency. It's, it's an economy that's a 100% bubble. It doesn't even have the temerity to at any stage be real. I mean, at least bubbles and things like oil or gold or housing or tulips is in the original example from the lowlands. At least these bubbles had actual physical products that they supposedly represented in the real world, circulating, exchanging, changing hands. No such thing exists in cryptocurrency. It's a bubble that's based on speculating on bubbles. I mean... Now, blockchain does have utility, and I, I do think that we could use blockchain as a communicator of value in the future that is not a dead mode uh, of human comprehension. But it is something that, that, that the way that, just like banking, for instance, banking has a legitimate use. It is how we essentially Essentially, the banking is the buying and selling of time for a prorated interest rate that's agreed upon. The problem with banking is that it's incredibly predatory. It attracts predators and attracts speculators who essentially con people out of their money and hand them empty promissory notes that are based on nothing but money that does not exist in the future and that is spent by them in the present to essentially impoverish everyone else. This is usury in its most blatant and disgusting form, and an unholy amount of our economy is based on doing just this. I mean, it makes me think th sick thinking about it. But but it didn't start with crypto. Our entire fine, our entire housing industry is based on these speculative bubbles. Our entire consumer product industry is based on these financial speculative bubbles. It's all fake all the way down. And it leads to people getting poorer and poorer and poorer to the point where people can't even eat. But somehow we're still rich because we can afford an iPad. What the fuck does that even mean? Asteroidal Assassin for $5 USA. I visited Austin with my friends and I feel completely on edge being in blue America. Just imagine how horrific it would be for a Palestinian moving to Europe and witnessing the sheer horror of these rainbow-painted sidewalks. Oh, yeah. I mean, I Blue America used to be a nice place. Blue America used to be filled with people who were open-minded, who were curious about the world, who had a Promethean spirit, who weren't afraid of everything, and who were not sycophants to every new social media phrase or guilt-wracked, hysterical effeminate losers. There used to be a genuine spirit in this area, a genuine lust for life. And now it's all performative. Now it's all fake. Now it's all policed and long-housed and pre-planned. It's, it's a tragedy because, I mean, it, it's a tragedy because 
I, I see in Blue America kind of the decline of the only people that I ever had as a real people. And right now I'm a I'm a nomad looking for a new one in a lot of ways. Uh, Sam153 says, extra tip for the monologue. Thank you very much. I felt it was kind of a weird one today. I kind of didn't know where I was going if that wasn't obvious. But I think it came around. It hit all the points. But thank you very much. World War Free says, they are building many retirement homes for boomers at my, lo at my locality in Florida. In 10 or 20 years, when the boomers have the stage after the flood, the area will be totally different. What will happen? Most businesses here target boomer money. Oh, well, World War Free, no, no one notices. No one knows what will happen when this all evaporates. No one, no one knows what will happen uh, if the government collapses. I mean, this is another thing with the whole Juniper Tree comment. She, she, she speculated about what, what women ran. You know, intelligent, high IQ women need things to do in the real world. They do, and. and Women have a more clustered IQ, but it's just more clustered. It's not, the mean isn't any lower. So there are an enormous number of women who, who have a certain amount of ambition for their, for, for their talents, so to speak. How are they put to use in a way that's not insulting to them? Well, well, traditionally, they were put to use in things like creating organizations that support the elderly. In, in, in creating churches, in creating ethnic societies, in, in driving forward social life, and in charities. All of this has essentially been given over to government and is managed in a complete Ponzi scheme. If this collapses, and it is slowly in the process of financially collapsing, something like this will have to be built, or the boomers and the old people who are left over are going to be dying alone in a rat-infested, uh, a rat-infested, geriatric system and they're going to have no one to take care of them uh thank you very much world war free i'm going to go on to the next one paul c for usa 15 dollars. hey david great stream i would like to continue someone's tradition but it seems my family is mostly a product of the boomer liberal area mentality they do not have a tradition anymore what should i do it seems like our only option is to start from scratch from older ones or from newer ones. Uh, so, Paul, see, you have to start with the basics. So think of things that you are you have to do anyway. Religious practice should be at the top of your list. If you currently are in a state that you can't believe, just attend a church and see how it goes. Just go and see how you feel about attending the church. And... Uh, and, and, but but then what you want to do is you want to start. I don't know how young you are, and so this highly depends on how young you are. But start trying to develop traditions around things like cooking, dinner parties, uh, potentially folk music if you're into that. Uh, see what your family has in its archives and see if there are other people that are doing similar things. Culture is practiced. It's not remembered. I mean, it is remembered in the practice, but you can't have traditions if you don't practice those traditions. And practice of these traditions is always carried out communally. Communally. So, so that's my suggestion. Try, try to think along those lines. I, I wish I could give you more on that last front. How would you carry on traditions if you don't have any? Um... I don't know. I don't know what happened. I mean, th there were all these ethnic organizations. There were all these folk organizations. Like, shape note singing would be a good example. And a lot of them have just kind of gone the way of the dinosaurs after COVID. I don't know how much of how many of those still exist. I'm hoping eventually that basket weaving can sort of adopt some of these organizations on their last legs, and kind of move in to fill those gaps. I'll be very interested in taking direction from that. But we still haven't actually experimented with, with what it would take to, to move the ball forward in this area. Kevin Pulliam for $5 USA. Hey, Dave, here in Virginia, it's an election year. The GOP ads talk about families and Dem ads are 100% abortion. And yet they will win 
At some point, don't we just deserve what we get? Also, any thoughts on the Eucharistic presentation in New York City? Seemed super great. Um, well, I heard that there was some kind of Eucharistic presentation in New York City. I didn't really look into that. Was that one of these Dime Square things with all of the young Catholics participating? Uh, I mean, it, it, they could do a real bang-up job if you had the right people in charge of that, for sure. But I don't know. I mean, you are 100% correct. We deserve what we get. And everyone knows we deserve what we get, which is why it's impossible to imagine. It's, it's, it's so easy to imagine an apocalypse and so hard to imagine a restoration. We just have to be prepared to pick out the pieces. We have to be prepared with a ground game when things come. And then that involves continuing on traditions. And here's another good thing. Sports. There should be traditions around sports. Sports that we can play. Now, I'm kind of getting to the point in my life where learning a new sport is a very, very difficult thing. I have a serious injury that makes it difficult for me to learn new sports. But this is something that I think is very, very important for young men to participate in something competitive with a group of other men. Something competitive and in the real world. Ideally physical, but in a pinch, I would accept you know, chess or another board game as well. Just something that you can use as a sport that you can define yourself in relationship to. That's another huge area of tradition that we need to start fostering and hopefully fostering inside of our basket weaving communities. But thank you very much, Kevin. Kevin Pulliam for $3 USA. Also, one more. Thoughts on the Daily Wire kids show announcement? Do you think it's a good thing to have alternatives or is all entertainment inherently deracinating? Thanks so much, and God bless. Well, um, the Daily Wire really is... I, all entertainment is not deracinating, because, I mean, what, cooking is kind of an entertainment? That's not deracinating. Uh, singing folk songs is entertainment? That's not deracinating. Even watching movies, good movies, is not deracinating. It's better if it's if it's a tradition. It's better if you know every year we go see Handel's Messiah, every single year. That's a tradition. My parents did that. Hopefully, my child will do that. Hopefully, children in the future will do that. These are how traditions are formed. They always involve some amount of entertainment. They always involve some amount of catharsis. So that's not inherently bad. Now. The problem with the Daily Wire and all of their stuff is that uh, they tend to copy the modern day stuff. So, like their animation style, it looks like CalArts. It looks like CalArts. So, even if they did get a based scriptwriter that was able to contact some kind of real human catharsis and real meaning, which they're certainly capable of doing, there's certainly no lack of good people out there. It's still, I still have to be reminded every frame that, that this is copying the style of the language that our enemies use. This is the same problem with Christian rock. I mean, they all sounded like the contemporary rock bands of their time with Christian lyrics. If you wanted to do an animation show, if Daily Wire wanted to do an animation show, they should have tried to attempt some kind of earlier style that looked more stylized. They shouldn't have gone for this minimalistic cow art stuff. I really don't think that was a good idea. They should have had the confidence to make it their own. Um, anyway, thank you very much, Kevin Pulliam. I'm going on to the next one. Clovis Danielson for $3 USA. Do you have a worldly hope to share for the faithful and meek this side of the eschaton? Um, well, I mean, the worldly hope that we have is... You said worldly, so I'm not going to say faith in God. But the worldly hope we have is that there are a number of young men who are dedicating themselves to right-thinking principles, to ordered principles, to religious principles, and who are actually organizing things in their community and trying to take a step forward that way. There are also some, but not nearly enough, boomers and older people who are waking up and realizing that they want to leave something else to their children. They want to leave a legacy to their children. 
you've got that that's the hope we have right now and there will be a new political coalition and and if we get the right people into power we can build some very very robust institutions and some very robust communities and it's not everywhere right now the organization stuff is still on its first feet for sure there's a lot of jank in the system that needs to be ironed out and a lot of the boost is going to come in 2024 when the next election season starts up. I hate to say it, but it's true. And, and I really regret this thing about myself. Like, I'm not in my 20s. Like, I wish I could be in my 20s, guys. I wish I could be on the front lines of these things. I wish I didn't have to hold down a job and, and you know, and, and a family at the same time and also have, you know, emerging some emerging health problems of this area of my life. Like, I wish I could be there on the front lines, but I am hopeful in the fact that we do have younger guys that are standing up and taking the next step in this approach. So that's my hope in the world, sense for you guys out there. Unmil Banerjee for $10 USA. This has got to be the time when knowing of the cathedral is so helpful. Palestine Solidarity in Harvard Square and a week later, check the New York Times coverage. Intra-American conflict infl inflamed, anti-neocon move. While I'm glad to see America fight itself, the evil of using the blood of Jews and Muslims. Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't think America is using the blood of Jews and Muslims in this case. I mean, the Jews and Muslims started this fight. It's not America's, I mean, the cathedral, I guess you could say, by being weak and by not breaking up this fight, they caused it. But, you know, I read a Mench's Moldbug essay that made the same argument. And in a certain sense, like, a, it, when you have a weak sovereign, everything could be blamed on the government. But just for the historical record, Umil Banerjee, since I'm pretty sure you're not Christian, uh, Christian civilization isn't taken any blame for the shit that occurs outside of its boundaries uh, we are not playing this game anymore especially since we do not have any sovereign that represents our interests in the slightest there is no collective representation of christianity in the modern world and i am not willing for any christian people to take blame for something that they manifestly did not start we are not doing the guilt game anymore for this shit and i mean this is gonna this is going to have to be a message that's going that's going to be carried forward to the rest of the world, be you Hindu, Muslim, or Jewish. Your conflicts are your own problem. We pray that you have strong sovereigns. We will try to work for peace. We will try to fight against the apparatus that is the current weak sovereign of the world that is, by lack of doing anything, potentially causing these problems in some abstract sense. But we are not in any ways guilty for doing this. We're not guilty for the wars you wage against each other. And, and I respect your people enough and Jews and Muslims enough to respect their own agency as moral arbiters of their own destiny. And, and so as... In that spirit, I do not allow us to take blame for these wars by proxy. Anyway, Owen Zaleski for $5 USA. Hello, Dave. I hope you're well. Excited for the event on the 4th. I still need to write that speech. <laughs> M.R. James, the ash tree. M.R. James is one of the great uh, horror story writers. Although I don't remember the ash tree. I'll have to reread that one. M.R. James's the ash tree is one of my favorite of his stories. I find at this time of year, it's good to meditate on divinity found in ugliness and weakness of the world through faith. Yeah, I mean, because we are in communication with with the things of the dead this month in particular, it's good to, sp because we are in many ways in communion with a lot of dead gods and a lot of dead ancestors who are not living as saints in the spirit of, uh, of all, all Souls Day. It is good to acknowledge the current dead god and the current dead souls that rule our own world and realize that they are illusions and that whatever life exists in the world has to be done in spite of them. And, and with, with absolute disrespect for the power they pretend is their own but do not wield. 
But thank you for that sentiment, Owen Zelensky, and I'll, I'll move on to the next one. D's Surprise Corfu Beach Day gives a chat without a comment. Thank you very much. Uh, Leo John Gannett for $10 says every single prominent right winger should challenge a prominent bread tuber to a telecast MMA match. With the challenge, you always cry about killing your enemies. Here is a chance to do it. You won't, though, because you won't fight for the honor of the ideals you actually believe in. Well, that would be funny. That would be funny. An MMA fight against bread tubers and dissident right would be really, really funny. Um, but it will never happen. I, I would settle Leo, Leo John Gennett. I'd settle if we could actually get them into conversation. This is the absolute right time to be engaging the left in dialogue. Absolutely the right time to be engaging them in dialogue. They don't want to because they know that the consequences will be very bad for them. But it's also the right time to be nice to leftists as well. And I know I get angry at them just as much as the next person. But this is the right time to reach out. This is the right time to have dialogue. This is the right time to build bridges. Because their ideas are a dead end. It's apparent they're a dead end. It's apparent that their world that they prophesize is not going to come into existence. And we are the only ones dealing with political realities as they actually are. Period. Gray Smog for $10 USA. What do you think is the most important verse in the Old Testament? What do you think is the most important verse in the New Testament? When I was Shapiro fanboy, I remember saying that Genesis 127, God created man in his own image, was the most important verse. I'm not sure he was right anymore. Oh, man, I don't know about the most important verse. Um... I always think, well, as a Catholic, I always feel like the most important verse is the the Eucharist and, and Christ's words on the cross. Those always strike me as the most important in the New Testament, where when he asks his disciples, who do you think I am? That I always found who do you think I am to be kind of the fundamental question that exists in all points in the Bible, which is why my favorite verse of the old testament is always when god asks moses what is your name and god answers i am i am or i am that is or i am that that is being the the sort of recursive answer he gets from god i felt that that's that's the mystery that seems to be wrapped up in all other verses of the bible and therefore i feel like it's a key it's a, it's, a, it's a door that you can walk through and see a, a richer Bible on the other side. Gray Smog for $5 USA. You know a lot about economics. What economic YouTube series, books, and theories would you recommend? I know a lot about economics. Oh, man. I don't think I ever read very many economics. I mean, doesn't Academic Agent have a whole series on, on the fundamentals of economics? I've heard it's really, really good. I heard it's a really good one, so maybe start there. It, it's a paid-for course, though. Um, I don't know. I, I've read a lot of G.K. Chesterton. I've read a lot of Von Misses and Hayek when I was a cringe libertarian. A lot of it's just hearing explanations on various ideas. And I also did engineering. That's I, I do an engineering job that requires you to deal in economics. So I have education from formal education in that regard. I'm not aware of any YouTube channels that teach this well because a lot of them are highly poisoned by ideology and I don't want to give you a channel that's going to give you some kind of leftist pretense about economics. I don't know. Our, our current economic ruling establishment are insane. Paul Krugman has for the last two weeks been posting a chart where he says, we defeated inflation. And it's this chart that says inflation if you exclude if you if you exclude housing, education, energy, and real estate, okay, so it's the inflation numbers. If you include food, shelter, community, transportation, heating, and all other necessary qualities of life, so if you exclude every single thing that's important, then inflation's actually going down. In any other age, an intellectual seriously publishing that argument inside uh, any medium 
it would be an embarrassing joke for the rest of his career. The fact that Paul Krugman has published and republished and republished this very same argument again and again means that we live in an academic environment and an environment of truth that is fundamentally unserious. We are ruled by children. And the children have erected a false god and then we await for the coming chaos and the night and the coming of a new god that will bring the dawn. And with that, I'm done with my super chats and on to reading the, the psalm verse for today, which is Psalm 68. May God arise, may his enemies be scattered, may his foes flee before him, may you blow them away like smoke. As, map, as wax melts before the fire, may the wicked perish before God, may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God, May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God, sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him, his name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. Is God in his holy dwelling? God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing. But the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. When you, God, went out before your people, you, when you march through the wilderness, the earth shook, the heavens poured down rain. Before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the one of Israel, you gave abundant showers, O God. You refreshed your weary inheritance. Your people settled in it, and from your bounty, God provided for the poor. The Lord announces the word, and the women who proclaim it are mighty throng. King and armies flee in haste. The women at home divide the plunder. Even while you sleep among the sheep pens, the wings of my dove are sheathed with silver, its feathers, its feathers with shining gold. When the Almighty scattered the kings in the land, it was like snow fallen on Mount Zion. Mount Bashan, majestic mountain, Mount Bashan, rugged mountain, why gaze in envy, you rugged mountain, at the mountain where God chooses to reign, where the Lord himself will dwell forever, the chariots of God are in their thousands and thousands. The Lord has come from Sinai into his sanctuary. When you ascended on high, you took many captives. You received, gift, you received gifts from people, even from the rebellious, that you, Lord, might dwell there. It's not the end of the psalm, but I'm hearing that I'm called away to something greater to deal with with my family, so I'll end this dream there. Everyone have a wonderful rest of the night, a blessed evening, and I'll see you next week.